members. Order. The next item on the order paper is the second stage of the Budget No. 2 Bill. I call the Minister for Finance. I beg to move that the second stage of the Budget No. 2 Bill be agreed. The second stage of the Budget No. 2 Bill has been moved in accordance with conventions. The Business Committee has not allowed any time limits on this debate. I call the Minister for Finance to open the debate upon the Bill. Mr Conor Murphy. Uh, the second stage debate today follows the approval of the supply resolution earlier this afternoon by the Assembly for the 2020-21 further vote and account. As I explained in the debate earlier, accelerated passage of the bill is necessary in order to ensure royal assent before any departments reach their cash limits for 2021 set in the Budget Act NI 2020. I am grateful to the Finance Committee for confirming that in line with Stanton Order 42, the bill can proceed under accelerated passage. The situation this year is unprecedented and could not have been envisaged at the time the last budget bill was being considered in the Assembly back in February. However, it is hoped that we will soon be able to return to some degree of normality to the financial process. It is my intention to bring the main estimates to this House in early autumn, and I can assure the Finance Committee that there will be full engagement on the financial position prior to this. Previlas Cancorla, the Assembly Stant in Order 32 directs that the second stage debate should be confined to the general principles of the Bill, and I shall endeavour to keep to that direction. This Bill will authorise the cash and use of resources and services to allow departments and other bodies to operate through the period of the COVID-19 response and the gradual exit from lockdown. Detailed main estimates and a further Budget Bill will then be brought to the Assembly in early autumn. Copies of the Budget No. 2 Bill and the Explanatory and Financial Memorandum have been made available to members today, and the 2020-21 further vote and account was laid in the Assembly on the 20th of May. The Bill will authorise the issue of a further £8,225,189,000 from the Consolidated Fund and the further use of resources totalling £9,050,940,000 by the departments and certain other bodies listed in Schedules 1 and 2 of the Bill in the year ending 31 March 2021. The cash and resources are to be spent on used in services listed in Column 1 of each schedule. These amounts are in addition to the amounts authorised by this Assembly in the Budget Act NI 2020 in March. I would like to stress that the amounts contained in the vote on account do not represent a set expenditure position. This is not an attempt to restate the 2020-21 budget position, which was approved by the Assembly on 5 May. As I said, at that time, the budget could not contain the majority of the funding available for the COVID-19 response. Since, the executive has allocated since then, the Executive has allocated significant amounts to support our health service, the economy and vulnerable people. This vote on account is essential to allow departments to spend that money. It is based on a percentage of each department's 2019-20 provision, and that percentage has been calculated to reflect their likely cash and resource requirements in 2020-21, including the impact of COVID-19. It will extend the existing 45 per cent vote on account provided in the Budget Act NI 2020 to a much greater level. This will ensure that all departments have sufficient cash to continue to provide services until the end of October. In normal circumstances, a vote and account would apply a uniform percentage on the previous year's position provision to all departments. That is not possible under the current circumstances. The COVID-19 response has not impacted all departments in the same way. The additional allocations made by the Executive have been targeted at the highest priority measures. The measures fall to a number of departments to deliver. The Executive has responded quickly and flexibly to the COVID-19 emergency, and I announced further allocations as recently as last Tuesday, the 19th of May. Clause 2 of the Bill provides for the temporary borrowing by my department of £4,112,595,000. This is approximately half the sum authorised by Clause 1 for issue out of the Consolidated Fund. I must stress that, to clo that Clause 2 does not provide for the issue of additional cash out of the Consolidated Fund or convey any additional spending power. It does enable my department to run an effective and efficient cash management scheme. The use of sole authority of the Budget Act was raised during the debate in the Budget Bill last March. When the Department is making use of the sole authority of the Budget Act, it will highlight this fact by placing a note with a black box symbol in the corresponding estimate. Because the main estimate for 2021 will not be available until the autumn, I want to make the Assembly aware that a number of Departments will be highlighting some functions which will be carried out in 2021 under the sole authority of the Budget Act. The Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs will be undertaking expenditure on coastal community fund projects. 
The Department for Communities will be undertaking expenditure on welfare miti reform mitigation. The Department for the Economy will be undertaking expenditure in support of HMS Caroline as a visitor attraction and also supporting the work of NI Screen. The Executive Office will be undertaking expenditure relating to the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse within the Historical Institutional Abuse Act 2019 on the implementation of the Hart Report and on Good Relations. Details of all functions carried out in the 2020-21 under the sole authority of the Budget Act will be highlighted with, it, with black boxes in the normal way in the notes to the 2020-21 main estimates when they are brought to the Assembly in the autumn. Mr. Speaker, this legislation is required to ensure that public services can continue to be delivered during this COVID-19 response period as we begin to emerge from the lockdown. It will ensure that we can continue to support the health service, businesses and vulnerable people. And I am happy to deal with any points of principle or detail of the budget bill that members may wish to raise. I beg to move. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Finance Committee, Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. And right from the beginning, can I declare an interest? Because I started my naval career a very, very, very long time ago on HMS Caroline. Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, as we have heard, the Budget Bill before us today provides further statutory authority for expenditure as set out in the Vote on Account, which allows departments to incur expenditure in response to the COVID-19 pandemic until the main estimates are voted on by the Assembly later in the year. Standing Order 42.2 states that accelerated passage may be granted for a Budget Bill, provided that the Committee for Finance is satisfied that has been appropriately consulted on the public expenditure proposals contained in the bill. At its meeting on the 20th of May, departmental officials provided oral evidence to the committee and answered questions on the budget bill being debated today, including on issues relating to a number of departments. As I pointed out in the debate earlier, the scale of the cumulative changes resulting from our response to the pandemic have been significant, which is why it is necessary for the bill to pass swiftly to eradicate the risks of departments running out of money at such a critical time. We are all operating under circumstances that are out of the ordinary, and this requires us to undertake our work with a degree of flexibility to support the aims that we need to achieve. The Committee certainly is cognisant of this need and welcomes the engagement that it has had from the Department thus far. However, as I alluded to in the debate earlier, as a Committee, our role is to advise assist and scrutinise the functions of the Department as we navigate through the myriad of issues that we face. And where necessary, the Committee will continue to challenge the Department of Finance as we seek to understand policies that impact on our society, and we will offer suggestions and advice to drive improvements. At its meeting last week, the Committee was briefed by departmental officials on the background and necessity for an additional budget bill which, as we all know, is a further measure to assure the continuation of the work of the public sector and on our response to the pandemic. The Committee explored with officials the rationale for how the amounts specified in the Bill relate to the departmental spending requirements until the main estimates are produced, which, as we have heard already, we are expecting in September. Whilst noting that they have also been rounded to the nearest 5 per cent, members also sought and received assurances that these requirements will be sufficient. And as I'm sure the Minister will be aware, we did explore the issue of increasing the amount of percentage available to departments if that was the case. And if indeed we end up, and hopefully we do not end up with the second wave of the pandemic, we may indeed have to be able to look at that. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, we are now entering a critical phase which will be determined by how we as a society respond to the easing of the necessary measures to allow our lives to return to a more familiar sense of normality. We need to turn our focus to the medium and longer term with a credible plan that will seek to support our citizens, our businesses and prosperity. I welcome last week's announcement from the Minister, which saw the extension of the rates holiday until 31 April. At last week's meeting, a number of committee members acknowledged that the Department, by and large, has stepped up to the mark and had listened and responded to the concerns of those that have been adversely impacted financially by the pandemic. Whilst I acknowledge this offer cons offers considerable assurance to the business community, it also raises questions around what will happen from August for those businesses that, as many of us MLAs will know, 
that seem to have fallen through the cracks. Whilst acknowledging the intricacies and the challenges they create, we also need to recognise that there are thousands of businesses across Northern Ireland who are not sure if they will be in the business over, and will be in business over the medium term. I welcome the Minister's announcement that there will be support on a phased basis targeted to the sectors that have been hardest hit. But to provide certainty, we need to understand what proposals are currently being considered so that we can, as an Assembly, contribute and influence how this phased approach will operate. Minister, it would be helpful later on today, at your winding up, if you could set out the types of the issues being considered as part of the targeted scheme, i.e. the level of support and over what period. If you could explain the rationale for how the levels of support for the hardest, six, hardest hit sectors have been prioritised. Provide a commitment to the House that the Committee for Finance will be consult consulted during these formative stages on the proposals. And could we encourage the Minister to encourage the Northern Ireland Executive to expedite the recovery plan, the economic recovery plan that we've been promised for at least the last two weeks, and indeed the First Minister stated two weeks ago we would have presently. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we will also need to take account of the costs associated with such targeted support, because indeed these will be significant. During the oral evidence last week, the committee noted that there is an overcommitment arising from non-domestic rates. And whilst officials were confident this could be met in year, we also need to ensure that any future support is fully costed and underpinned by a robust rationale to maximise its impact. We will ask the Minister to clarify the extent of this overcommitment and is he in a position to outline how he intends to meet it in year. Of course, this all has to be done within a constrained window. 31st July is less than 10 weeks away. It is therefore critical that businesses are given sufficient time to understand if and how they will be affected and whether they will fall within this targeted approach. As the House is aware, the Committee for Finance has a specific function to play when considering whether a budget bill should proceed under the accelerated passage procedure. The engagement by the Department with the Committee has been instrumental in ensuring that the Committee is satisfied that it has been consulted appropriately. It was on this basis that the Committee agreed at its meeting last week that it was content to grant accelerated passage as provided for in Standing Order 42.2. As you have already stated, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I have written to you on behalf of the Committee to confirm its decisions. May I say on behalf of the Committee and also the Ulster Unionist Party, we support this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I call Mr Paul Frew. Mr Deputy Principal, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and, uh, I suppose, again, this is a funny sort of day because, one, first of all, we've had accelerated passage, but we're also now going from first reading to second reading within hours. And again, that's even accelerated from accelerated passage, I think. Um, so again, these are surreal times. And, and my tendency as a scrutinizer is always to put the brake on. And of course, I, I realize that in order for me to put the brake on, it's for me to try and get my head around the figures and to scrutinise and try and do the best job I can in scrutinising the figures. And I know that's not possible uh, because of the, the emergency we're in and because of the fact that we need to get money down quickly. So I understand the procedure we're now in. I don't like it. I understand it. And we're, of course, uh, prepared to accept it simply because it's a necessity. But I really do worry. I really do worry about the level of scrutiny that this chamber and then the committees can give with regards to the budgetary settlements to our departments and then the spends within our departments. Because whilst we should be looking at a main estimates booklet very, very soon, what we have here is a loose number of pages that gives us headline figures of what each department is going to get. And we don't see any real detail of uh, or scrutiny of what the actual in-depth departments are. Now, some committees will have that. Uh, the Finance Committee members may have a bit more latitude with regards to delving into the figures. But really, to do our job properly in this forum, in this assembly, we need to have as much oversight, as much of a panoramic view as possible. 
And it's just not possible to have that at this time. And that really, really worries me. We should be having debates in this place around aligning a budget with a programme for government. But we aren't. We can't. And that really worries me and concerns me. We, we forget about COVID-19 for one wee second, please. Some of our public finances are in a very bad place. When you hear about infrastructure, road network, water and sewage plants, holding up development of houses and homes for our people, these are big ticket issues that will tax the most experienced of assemblies and governments. And yet, we haven't even got to grips with any of that. We can't even get we can't even lift our head up to get to grips with any of that because we're still dealing with COVID-19 emergency. So I fear for the future with regards to what this place can achieve in trying to ask the answer the big ticket questions for society going forward. And that really worries me. But what also worries me is the level of detail that's still getting down to our committees. It strikes me that our, our last line of defence is the committee structure and the people on those committees that are there to get right down into the detail of their particular departments. And they can only do that by the information that they have received from their department. And that really, really concerns me because I don't believe that that information, some departments are better than others but not all departments are giving that information out. I suppose have the blessing that I sit on the Department of, or the Committee of Finance, which gives me a bit of an overall umbrella approach, panoramic view, but I also sit on the Justice Committee. Now, the members who would have been in the chamber the last time when the chairman of the Justice Committee raised points in a very robust manner, but very timely manner, and a very right and appropriate manner, to the concerns that he had around the Justice Department giving information to the Justice Committee. It's deeply disturbing and totally unacceptable that the Department failed to provide information on a range of high-profile matters categorised as other significant pressures, particularly given no other Department left pressures uncosted in the templates completed for their respective committees. Most people won't know this, maybe, but the, the Committee of Finance, through the RAISE program office, pushed through a template, a uniform document to all committees to get answers off their departments. And it's the way to go. It is the way to make sure we get consistent information down to our committees so that we can look at these things in a comparative view. It's a very, very good exercise, and I believe, I believe in it. Because what it has done already is shine, up, shine a light into the information that departments aren't giving us, and that's the Department of Justice in this case. And I have been aware of this because I sit on the two committees. The Justice Department had submitted responses to information requests from the Department of Finance and had provided details of costs identified across the justice system. However, it did not inform the committee of the amount of the bid that had been submitted to manage pressures, resulting from the pandemic of $38.8 million. And it provided the committee with no information on the breakdown of COVID-19 resource requirements submitted to the Department of Finance. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, that is unacceptable in this day and age when we have come back to this place, when we cannot have business as usual, when we can have no hidden things in this place. It is totally and utterly unacceptable that departments would hold that information from committees, the very scrutiny committees that are there and designed to assist the department and the minister. It is unacceptable that we would not have sight of that. The details of the $38.8 million was instead received by the Committee of Finance, where I sit, 
who had been provided it from the Department of Finance. The details hide, highlight the inclusion of an estimated pressure of 0.9 million in relation to a legal aid COVID-19 interim payment scheme. Now we're not talking about big money, but that's not the point. It's not 0.9 million. It may as well be 9 million. It may as well be 90 million. It's the fact that the department did not give this information to the Committee for Justice. This is, in fact, a direct contradiction to the information that had been provided to the Committee in the Department's policy paper on the payment scheme. That paper advised that the costs associated with the scheme would be administered from the existing legal aid budget and gave no indication that a bid for this pressure had been submitted. Here we have a minister and a department who, granted, has to think quickly because it is a COVID-19 issue, not even thinking it right to give the committee that information, or being blasé at the least for it. And isn't it good that we've had the structure whereby the Department of Finance gives that information to the, the, the Committee for Finance, which then can be threw back to the Committee of Justice? But that's a very convoluted way of doing business, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's a way I do not like. And I, I believe that this is the one case that I've picked up. There are probably many others that men members will have to pick up in their own departments. But this needs to be shone light on, and this needs to be taken further, because we have to get to a place where we, as individual MLAs, are treated with respect. In this House, this Assembly is treated with respect. And if we're not getting the information we require, then that is not treating committees and members, MLAs, with respect. It's in fact treating them with disdain. And that cannot happen. That has to be completely moved, removed from this place. No more going back, no more business as usual. This is a different place we're in. This is a, a place of decisionism. So let's see those decisions playing out and let's get full scrutiny of it. I, I'll move on, Minister. Or, Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker, to the point I made earlier, and I, forgive me please, because I, I, I need to ask the Minister about this again. And maybe it's my mind, maybe it's just the way I work. But the Minister in the previous debate on the vote of account said that the utility regulator for Northern Ireland had received 90% of funding for this year. And, and I'm not saying that's wrong. What I'm saying is I can't see that. I can't see that in any of this, these, this detail. And maybe I'm looking at them wrong. Maybe I'm looking at the figures wrong. But what I do see is I see two schedules. I two, two, two schedules on, a, on the budget bill, and not once does it mention the Northern Ireland Utility Regulator. And I think that's because they're not getting any more money in this voting account. I could be wrong. I'm putting it out there. Uh, but what I do see is that I see in the first in, in the foot of account in the first resources table one, I think that utility regulator has only received forty five percent of their yearly spend. And I think they've they're still out with some one hundred and forty four thousand pounds, having received one hundred and nineteen thousand pounds. And then on the second table, which is cash. We're talking about a figure of 1.3 million, which they have received 333, sorry, 330,000. Now, if my math's right, that's about 25 per cent. Now, I'm not saying the utility regulator needs more money. What, I, what I'm saying is, why wouldn't we give the utility regulator, and it's the only body that doesn't receive money, and it's the only body that's not mentioned on the face of the bill. I'm saying if we're allowing latitude for the Food Standard Agency, the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission, the Northern Ireland Audit Office, they don't, they don't even need money for COVID-19. But they're, they're being allowed to get more of their money through the photo of account, like the departments are. But the only, department, the only office that's not is the Northern Ireland uh, Utility Regulator. And I know it's funded differently, and none of those bodies that I listed are funded Identical, or are the same bodies, or do the same work. 
It just seems strange to me that you wouldn't afford utility regulator all of that money in case they need it before main estimates come in September. Now, the minister stated earlier that they have received 90%. That could be the case. I just can't see it in either the bill or the voting account. And I would really like the minister to go over it one more time for me. I might be wrong. I certainly don't understand it. And I would like him to clarify that position for me. But we've heard today, as we hear every day we talk about budgets, we hear about the pressures. We hear about the pressures on our system. We hear about pressures on our infrastructure, our communities, our education, our health system. And we could hear, if we were to list up all the pressures and all the wants and needs and requirements, we could probably spend our budget four times over. But we can't because there's not enough money there. So what I want to see also is not only the money that we need to spend, but the money that we're going to save. This is not the time to push forward with projects that ministers may want. This is the time for necessity. This is the time for hard and knuckle maths to get us back down to necessity, to make sure that the money that's spent from this executive caters for all of our people and not just some of our people. Now, there'll be vulnerabilities in our people that need to be accounted for. That's totally and utterly acceptable. But there are other things that may be able to wait. We may be able to wait till we see what the climate looks like after this event, to see how the economy is performing, how it has recovered, to see what money we get in on taxes and Barnett consequentials and, and block grant and then move forward from there. But when you look at the necessity for police officers that was mentioned by my colleague earlier, and that not being met, that pressure not being met, because we have all these other raft of things to spend. But those raft of things that we've been spending money on has always been there, but are they needed there? Surely there's something in each department that doesn't need the money the funding, the spend on. Maybe it's because of COVID-19. Maybe it's because we're doing things differently. Maybe it's because it wasn't a good thing really to do in the first place and we are actually progressing our thought process and we're actually saying, well, look, let's do something differently because to do something differently, we're more effective and we're more efficient and we save money. That's the sort of debate I want to have in this chamber, not about a list of pressures, but the foresight and the imagination to go forward to make sure that public pound goes as far as it can. Ensuring that what we're spending it on is exactly what we need and require and will actually help raise money or help people to raise money in the future. That's what I want to see the money invested in. Not spent, but invested in. And that could be invested in people. That could be invested in business. That could be invested in enterprise. But ultimately, we have to look through all of that. There are departments that are going to run out of money if we hadn't voted for the vote on account this morning. But can we really say that those departments are saying, well, here's what we're going to save. Here's what we're going to cut back. And here's why we need to do that. That's, a, that's something, that's a vacuum that's missing. That's, that's a space that's missing in this debate. And I suppose it's always been missing in our debates with regards to budgets. Maybe it would be different if we get to a strategic three-year budget. Maybe it would be different if we can align the programme for government onto the budget, because then that will justify every single budget stream to, a, to an output, to a programme for government output. Maybe that's the place we need to get to. But we're not there yet, and that troubles me. That really worries me. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it's a necessity that we do this. We have to wait for the main estimates in September. But really, the Finance Committee was looking forward to the draft budget for the next year in September. Where is that now? Can the Minister enlighten us as to a body of people, a body of work that's going on to draft that draft budget? 
because really that should be going out to consultation. The work should be going on in that budget now, but yet we're having to go through this process. It's not their fault. It's not the minister's fault we're in this COVID-19 situation. But we need to get forward. We need to step forward in a strategic fashion. So we need to see the draft budget for the next financial year in September so we can scrutinise it. But by that time, we'll be looking at the main estimates for this budget. And you can see how messy that's going to be and how easy it's going to miss things with regard to scrutiny. And that's not the place any of us want to be. Every single pound that we spend has to be accounted for. It doesn't matter whether it's 0.9 million that the Justice Committee has now found out about with regards to the Justice Department. As I said earlier, that may as well be 9 million, 90 million, 900 million. It's about the accountability, it's about the transparency, and it's about the scrutiny of this place to do our job. And we've been prevented from doing that when we do not receive all of the information from the departments. And that really worries me, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Good, uh, last can call you. I'm glad the last speaker said it wasn't the minister's fault we were in the COVID situation. He usually blames him for everything else, you know. But um, I just want to make a few uh, points, uh, last can call you, rather than repeat myself from this morning. Um, and I do commend the minister in this uh, unique circumstances of getting tens of millions out the door you know, to save livelihoods, wages, business, and protect that. And in normal circumstances, that may take six months with planning, consultations, etc. you know, but we were, we're not in normal circumstances. But the minister said, hopefully he'll bring a budget um, to the assembly, hopefully in the autumn. Now, the committee did agree that for this, uh, in these unique circumstances for you, uh, additional uh, budget, why it was needed, why the accelerated passage was needed, and it allows the departments to function over the coming months and the public servants services to be funded. So therefore in that context I support the bill, Gur Market. Thank you. I call Mr Matthew Tool. Thank you, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Perhaps we should have a, um, a debate on whether your title is Principal Deputy Speaker or Deputy Principal Speaker, because it's one of the great subjects of one of the th things that unites us in this House is that we don't know which it is. But anyway, um, <laughs> Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think it is. Um, I was concerned the member was going to say one of the few things that unites us in this House is contempt for the Principal Deputy <laughs> no, no, Speaker. No, no. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Not at all, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, so we are we're debating the the budget number two bill, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. We are at risk, given the nature of our proceedings, that we repeat everything that we said a few hours ago. So I'll try not to repeat everything that I said a few hours ago. Uh, I do have some uh, um, humane instinct in relation to the finance minister. I know he he isn't solely responsible for the COVID-19 crisis. I don't hold him responsible for everything. I know he's had to sit uh, through several long debates on this, um, so I won't repeat everything I said before. Um, I want to give a few broader thoughts um, in relation to uh, the Budget No. 2 Bill and our budgeting processes here and also our longer term uh, fiscal position, which is something I have laboured on um, in this Assembly before, but something that is really important. Um, a few days ago in the Chamber, the Education Minister repeated one of the great cliche clichés about this place. Uh, Winston Churchill saying after the First World War that after the waters of the war had subsided that the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone were still left with their eternal quarrel. Well, we obviously haven't quite moved on from that quarrel yet. Thankfully, we're uh, in this chamber debating it. Um, but it is true that as we emerge from uh, the COVID-19 crisis, and we won't fully emerge from it for a while, although it's worth saying and putting on the record that we have some very good news uh, in Northern Ireland today, cautiously good news but, uh, about um, numbers of fatalities. We are hopefully um, turning the corner in, in that sense, and we had good news from, from the Republic yesterday. But as we emerge from this crisis, it's extremely important that we use the opportunity to take down, to take a long calm look at our priorities as a region and as an executive. 
And given the nature of our budgeting processes and the fundamental thing about how we budget here is that we are given a block grant. The overwhelming majority of money that is spent by the executive is given to it. Um, whether you regard that as an act of um, beneficence and generosity or something that it's a product of um, uh, Northern Ireland taxpayers contributing to the Exchequer, that's how we're funded. So the primary strategic tool we have as an executive and as an assembly is the disbursement of money, which is what the, the finance minister is here talking to us today about. That's why it's completely critical that that budgeting process is linked into, as my, the, pre the preceding speaker, Paul Frew, mentioned, a set of programme for government um, targets. It's understandable that we don't have a completely agreed set of programme for government targets because we had three years off, um, but we are now past time to um, have a joined up strategy from the executive. Uh, yes, I appreciate, as the Finance Minister said in his early remarks, that my party is in the executive. I'm not seeking to cast blame in this. I'm seeking to um, talk about the importance of us all contributing to the debate, and that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, we do need to have use the emergence from the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity to look at our long-term fiscal position, but also our long-term goals as a society. And one of the interesting things about the uh, Northern Ireland's fiscal position is that, in a sense, it doesn't really matter what your constitutional preference is. That might seem like an absurd statement. We've heard today various people standing up and talking about, from different constitutional perspectives, their interpretation of Northern Ireland's fiscal position vis-a-vis -vis the UK Exchequer. Well, in a strange way, my view is that actually something that people who have different constitutional perspectives can agree on is that it is better for this place to be more, to be better able to raise its, raise its own revenue and spend money in a way that is, um, that is generated here. I, I personally think that's, that would be good for our society and good for our economy. So how do we get there? Well, part of how we get there is, and unfortunately we haven't been able to, to debate it yet since the institutions returned, is the creation of a, uh, some kind of long-term fiscal commission. The New Decade New Approach document talks about a fiscal council which has the vibe, if you like, of a uh, sort of treasury overseeing body, uh, which um, wouldn't necessarily be uh, ideal in some ways. But what we, I think what we really do need to see is, in addition to the Fiscal Council, we need to see a Fiscal Commission, or working with the Fiscal Council, we need to see a Fiscal Commission which looks at our long-term fiscal position in Northern Ireland, how we can possibly look for new ways of raising revenue in a way that is broader based than we have at present, because one of the lessons from this crisis is that our singular means of revenue raising um, is non-domestic rates, and that is the single most damaging uh, um, taxation on the sectors of the economy that are hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis. And I say this as a centre-left social democrat who believes in revenue raising and who believes in businesses paying their fair share of tax, but the, but, but the bold truth is that that particular tax does weigh heaviest on independent retail and hospitality, which are the sectors that we all know have been hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis. So, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to say today that it's really important that while we pass this budget number two bill, and I and my party um, support it, that we move at speed towards delivering on the fiscal council that has set out a new decade, new approach, but also the fiscal commission, uh, I think, that has been mooted uh, by others, including the minister, so that we can sit down and have a, a long-term look at our, at our, at our revenue-raising potential and our social and economic priorities. And in addition to that, and in the short term, I would like for the, um, for the minister to look at RRI borrowing powers. I think there are long-term structural challenges that have gone on for a long time in our economy that we haven't uh, had a chance to address. We're going to have to address them at some point. I hope that whenever the economy minister brings her plan forward, it addresses those in the context of COVID-19. Those include, but are not li limited to, long-term um, uh, structural issues with our productivity. Um, low, a low skills base, the problem of outward immigration among our young people, to either to go to university or afterwards and then not coming back. We need to address those things. Um, is, uh, is in the short term, can we make use of borrowing powers when, as I said earlier, borrowing costs through the UK Public Loans Board are extremely low to start to, to make some of those long-term capital investments? So, while I'm supporting the budget number two bill today, 
I would reiterate what I said earlier on, which was that we really do need to see a joined up economic and fiscal plan. And I don't say that to carp or uh, criticise the Minister. I say it because I think it's something we all have a responsibility to focus on. I would say one final tiny thing. I'm going to do what um, I've slightly had a dig at other people for doing in terms of particular spending pressures. One area that I think is a small, discrete area of spending that will not cost the earth but will be extremely beneficial to all of us and to society and communities is protecting local media. I've written to the Minister about this. A, a comparatively small amount of money, and we're talking in the very low single uh, millions, possibly even you know, the very, uh, but as low as you can get in the seven figures, um, would really help protect these community assets, which many of our communities will, frankly, be lost without if, 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 if we lose them. And, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. I call Mr. Andrew Muir. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I must declare at the outset I also have a link with HMS Caroline, but uh, Mr. Aiken, I'll explain that to you some other time. <laughs> um, I thank the Minister for his statement and for the officials who I know are doing an, uh, a very difficult job in extremely challenging circumstances. It seems a long time ago since the Finance Minister first made an announcement to the Chamber on the 31st of March. My party supports this budget. Uh, it's not perfect, but the fundamental role of a government is to set a budget, and we must step up to the challenge to enable continued delivery of public services. We welcome the increases in resource and capital funding. These increases come after years of austerity measures from Westminster following the financial crisis, which caused real damage to our public services, hitting the vulnerable the hardest. With the economic downturn arising from the COVID-19 crisis likely to be much worse than from 2007 onwards, we cannot allow the same mistakes to be repeated. I also welcome the additional funding that has come from New Decade New Approach, albeit very limited. New Decade New Approach funding was conditional on fundamental governance reforms in the Assembly and the Executive, as some members have referred to. The shortfalls were brutally laid out in the RHI report which we de debated in this place just at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. All parties must remember that a failure to live up to the commitments and the spirit a new decade, new approach could lead to re very real consequences for our people. Whilst I recognise the resource pressures upon officials in recent times, the establishment of the Fiscal Council, which Matthew O'Toole has referenced, must therefore be progressed, and I would appreciate an update from the Minister in the establishment of the Fiscal Council. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, we are all very well aware that this budget has been totally overshadowed by COVID-19. I broadly support the financial decisions the Executive have taken thus far. There will be a point in time to examine the value for money around that. The PAC has uh, got business scheduled tomorrow in relation to that. But the, the measures which have been taken thus far have been taken uh, with, for good justification. I particularly support the package of targeted rates relief that was announced last week. However, there are still people and businesses for whom the executive must do much more, such as, for example, sole traders, many of whom have been excluded from the recent grant measures. Turning to the year ahead, the ginormous financial challenges that we face are to a large degree beyond the executive's control. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has already led to over 26,000 people losing their jobs locally in Northern Ireland, taken from the recent unemployed claimant counts, compounded by the fact that I fear the worst is yet to come. Furthermore, as the UK Government seems unlikely to secure a trade deal with the EU, the potential consequences of no deal for Northern Ireland are severe. And today I have received correspondence from the Economy Minister saying that um, my department is very conscious of the potential for an increase in redundancies and has already put in arrangements in place to take into account the possibility of an increase in demand following EU exit. How anyone can sell EU exit as a benefit when we are getting correspondence about an increase in demand for redundancies is beyond me. There is, however, a number of important steps that the Executive can take as we face these deeply challenging and uncertain times. The right response from the Executive could prove the difference between a short recession and a long depression, an impact on hundreds and thousands of our citizens. Firstly, the Executive needs to ensure that its financial response to COVID-19 is coordinated and strategic. The steps thus far have focused 
on the emergency response and safeguarding businesses and frontline public services. Going forward, the focus must switch to stimulating a sustainable recovery, protecting public services and safeguarding people's jobs and incomes. I acknowledge the progress that has been done to date in relation to this as outlined by the Finance Minister with the, table, the paper to be considered uh, in terms of the economic recovery on Thursday at the Executive. And it is important that the Ministers for Finance and Economy come together with a robust and ambitious stimulus package to help Northern Ireland adapt to the new normal. This should include the establishment of an economic task force, bringing together the strongest voices across government, business, trade unions and the third sector in supporting decision making, a social partnership approach to recovery. Policy interventions must target the most economically and socially significant sectors, providing reskilling, training and employment opportunities for our workforce should also be at the centre of this strategy, with a particular focus on young people who look set to be the worst hit by the economic consequences of the pandemic. Having the right strategy in place is one thing, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, but we also must ensure that we have the money to see it through. Money dedicated to saving businesses today will not be well spent if we cannot provide the support required to ensure that these businesses and their employees can adapt to the new normal. Additionally, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, we need to ensure that capital projects that will be vital to stimulating our economy in both the short and long term can go ahead. Research from the University of Oxford has shown that green capital investments are the most effective, both in the short and long term, for a sustainable green recovery. At this point, I should declare I was previously a member of ARDS and North Downborough Council and an employee of TransLink. Existing infrastructure plans, such as the Belfast Transport Hub, investment in electric and hydrogen transport, the Belfast to Derry London Derry Railway Line must therefore be pushed forward apace. Funding should also be made available for active travel, where the executive is badly missing its own targets. The executive must also have a list of shovel-ready projects that can be put to work as soon as funding is made available. Redirecting budgets from capital to resource should be the last, not the first, course of action considered by government departments. While lobbying Westminster for additional funding is important, it should also make it better use of its own borrowing powers, as Matthew O'Toole has outlined, none of which are currently planned, including also the utilisation of financial transactions capital, which I do note has been planned. Finally, again on infrastructure, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the Executive must push ahead with its own plans, reforms to procurement and learn the lessons set out in the Northern Ireland Audit Office's 2019 report on capital, major capital projects. We also must ensure that our planning system is fit for purpose. The average time taken by the Department for Infrastructure to determine a plan application of 260 weeks in 2018-19 just isn't acceptable, never mind the longest period of 556 weeks. The need to undertake the long-awaited strategic review of planning and to establish a regional infrastructure panel or commission to identify and rapidly progress the most significant long-term infrastructure projects is clear, alongside a new infrastructure plan informed by advice from the panel or commission. The other area where the Executive can make a difference is public sector reform. My party has for years called for the Executive to tackle the cost of division, where every penny that we waste could instead be better spent supporting citizens and communities. We cannot blame austerity for all our budgetary problems. Having seen how much we rely upon the NHS during this pandemic, we must push ahead with the reforms laid out in Bengoa, a patient-centred approach focused on systems, not structures, is vital. And when it comes to new working practices, remote and flexible working arrangements have become the standard through COVID-19. The public sector should stand at the forefront of these changes and have the technology to be able to do so. In closing, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, it is be welcomed that once again, budgetary decisions that affect the people of Northern Ireland are being taken by local politicians who are accountable to them. The Executive has an immense responsibility to our community to steer, us out of, uh, steer our economy into the new normal and protect the health and livelihoods of our people. The budget 
and all our financial decisions should be centred on that goal. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I think it's fair to say that in all of our deliberations on the Budget Bill and the Supply Resolution today has been riddled by two words, coronavirus. And it's in that light, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that I want to mark in the House that since the 18th of March, today has been the first day where we have no COVID-related confirmed deaths in Northern Ireland. There has been many dark days in this chamber, but this is a chink of light, hopefully towards the end of a long, dark tunnel. I want to pay a tribute to the many health care workers, both in the NHS and our care homes, and other health professionals and key workers that have helped achieve this goal today. We all in this House can bear testimony to the fact of what has actually happened over the course of this last few months and how we have sought to deal with the emergency of our lifetime. And as with that said, I think that sets the context of what we're dealing with here today. Coronavirus has had a significant impact on this budget. We heard and I listened in to the Finance Committee and indeed other members have stated it, that if we do not act and act now, five departments will run out of money by July if further allocations are not given. That's stark statistics, but proves the point of where we are today and the reasons why. In February, after three years of silence this chamber, I had the ability to speak on a budget debate in my maiden speech. And I recall how I did so with optimism that after three years of inactivity, shameful inactivity, that this House was finally getting to grips with the issues that mattered to the Northern Ireland public, both unionist, nationalist and other. And I outlined in that contribution, namely health, education and the economy, all three issues which are indeed even an even worse state today and will be after this pandemic, given the significant uh, financial shortcomings that we've heard from the Minister and indeed the Government departments. There has been, as has been mentioned by Mr Frew, there has been little chance for committees and this chamber to scrutinise these budget allocations. And I, I know where we are in terms of uh, the time process that this has to happen and has to happen urgently in order to get that money through the door to those at much need. But I want to take time just to, to highlight some key issues which I think uh, deserve further uh, scrutiny in relation to how we go forward uh, in those particular budgets within departments. And I, I, I want to first of all talk about the health budget. Prior to COVID-19, there were some 420,000 people on our waiting list in Northern Ireland. We had heard the severe pressures that the system was facing. COVID-19 came. The health service was rightly given a priority status in order to protect life and save our NHS. In doing so, we demonstrated the ability to focus minds on the problem at hand. But my fear, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, as we emerge from this crisis, that that 420k on the waiting list has now been exacerbated. Treatment has in many cases been delayed and put on hold. There has been a dramatic reduction in cancer referrals and inevitably, sadly, cancer in many of our constituencies, or many of our constituents, will go undiagnosed. Recognising the executive's allocation for the Department of Health's COVID-19 pressures I would like to know, and maybe the Minister could maybe elaborate, what actions are being taken to address the cost of displacing many vital cancer services throughout this time? Because that is where the priority is going to have to shift in the days ahead. I also mentioned in that maiden speech on the Budget Bill the severe plight in Northern Ireland in relation to mental health. There can be no doubt in any mind in this House that mental health was a severe crisis facing us all. And I actually believed 
upon the restoration of the Assembly that there was unanimity in this House to try and help those that are suffering from mental health. And I, I, I think that's a fair comment from us all. I listened to speeches right across this House. There was a unanimity of purpose. There was a collectivity of how we could deal with it. Members were focused on the job at hand. But sadly, again, with COVID-19 and the need for people to stay at home, to stay in social isolation, anxiety levels are now higher than ever. People across this country are battling loneliness and depression, and it will be up to this Assembly and our executive colleagues to pick up the pieces. And I severely hope that budget allocations, be it to the Department of Health, have these particular causes in mind. The mental health crisis in Northern Ireland pre-existed this viral pandemic. And there is a real threat that this emergency will be compounded by COVID-19. And we need to be prepared for that. In relation to our economy, again mentioned in that original budget speech, how we as an assembly in our restoration could finally meet the needs of businesses who were crying out for support and help when this executive and this assembly let them down by inactivity and absence. During COVID-19, it is fair to say that government has, by and large, stepped up to the mark to help business. And I think it is important to point out the rates relief that has been allocated, because that is a lifeline for businesses, and the extension of that lifeline will help them in the post-COVID recovery. But we also must bear testimony that there are many that have fallen through the cracks. And we, as individual members in our constituencies, will be left again to pick up the pieces and rebuild those businesses and jobs within our constituencies. I think while there has been many sectors that have received financial support and help, a particular, and it has been mentioned in this House, a particular area of concern for me is the hauliers and support for those that are maintaining our food security across Northern Ireland. They're key workers that, sadly, I think have been let down by this place in COVID-19. And I would hope that consideration is given, both through budget allocations, etc., to giving them the much-needed support to see them through this difficult time. We've all heard the horror stories of how uh, freight transport is going out and into the UK mainland and coming back many times with, with empty loads. It's simply unsustainable, and they need help, and help urgently. Things, and this, this was a, a thread throughout many of the speeches in the, in, in the first budget debate. Things cannot continue as normal. That was post uh, a three-year suspension of this place. We hear it here again. Things can't continue as normal. And I must point out, because I listened uh, to Mr. Carroll's contribution on the supply resolution, where he talked about uh, and criticised this place for looking at creative ways in which we could bring revenue into Northern Ireland, and that in particular of the corporation uh, tax cut. You know, it can't be a case where it's take, take, take and spend, spend, spend in Northern Ireland. We must be creative and look at ways in which we can raise revenue. And if you think about it, Northern Ireland fell victim to this because it was mentioned, I think it was mentioned by Mr Muir a couple of minutes ago, of the 26,000 jobs that have already been lost to the Northern Ireland economy, with potentially worse coming in the, in the COVID response. Sorry, Mr Tony. I appreciate the honourable uh, the member giving away. Um, can I just confirm? He, he mentioned corporation tax and the need to raise revenue. He, would he accept that if he's talking about the policy of reduced corporation tax in Northern Ireland, that that would mean less revenue to spend here rather than more? Uh, and I thank the member for his intervention. But what I'm trying to say, the spin-off of a reduced corporation tax would put Northern Ireland businesses in a potential to attract inward investment that they have never been able to do so before. Because why? Those international businesses looked to the Republic of Ireland with a lower corporation tax. They were capitalising on our restricted ability 
to lower that corporation tax level. And I think looking at those creative measures are ways in which we have to collectively start to think about how we can do things differently in this place to ensure that international business can once again come to our shores and look at Northern Ireland's people, its place and its assets to great strength and see this economy back on its feet again, because that's what we're going to have to do, all of us. It's all hands on deck to ensure a post-COVID recovery and budget allocations by uh, the minister and other ministers and the executive are going to be crucial to do, doing so. I want to briefly comment on infrastructure. The co we already heard in, in earlier debates that how infrastructure and those capital projects were going to be vital uh, to maintaining the construction sector in Northern Ireland, which plays such a significant role. But in the public transport perspective, we have seen the customer base collapse and devastated due to COVID-19, and that shows no early signs of recovery given the inability to socially distance. But we also must, and again it has been mentioned about where the potential savings of COVID-19 to government departments have been, because there must be some out there because we, we have heard about how services cannot operate in the same fashion given uh, the social restriction nature in, in which we, we live in. But I have heard the horror stories about how, for example, trains are running, whether it is to Dublin or to other places, at the cost of thousands of pounds to the taxpayer with as little as three, four, five uh, customers. That can't continue. There must. Uh, Ministers must use that vital resource in a manner which protects the public purse. I also want to bear mention to a committee of my own in terms of the Communities Committee. And we have seen over the course of COVID-19 how the Communities Committee has been, or the Communities Department has been able to uh, allocate resource to some constituents who are most in need throughout this pandemic. But again, there are shortcomings. And I look at the charity sector, for example, and with a, a funding allocated uh, via the budget for COVID-19 pressures and a rescue package for charities, there are many that miss the boat and will slip through the cracks that are performing a vital, uh, life-saving role within our communities at this time. And I think we need to look at about how we can better support them through it. In closing, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to to focus on an issue which I know many members have been uh, engaged on, and that is in relation to relief and support packages for sporting clubs. The Sporting Hardship Fund, which allocated some in the region of a maximum of £2,000 per club if, if awarded uh, to help fight COVID-19 and uh, the pressures that they were facing in their own particular sporting organisations, is a lifeline to keep many of those sporting clubs alive. And this is going to continue. And that can be across all sporting fraternities. And it is important that we, we, we do fight for an equality of treatment for all sporting clubs to ensure that they can access some form of funding. But my fear, and again it has been highlighted because it was closed within two days, is the funding allocated is simply not enough to meet the need that is out there. I would like this to be, to, and I have no doubt it will be enhanced or that it can be reported back to the Communities Minister that they can look at something like the Sports Hardship Fund, an allocation resource that can help save many clubs who face potentially uh, no return after the pandemic and given how long this may, this may last. In closing, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe our budget debate here today, and indeed members' contrib contributions, must focus around one word, and that of prioritisation. We have all mentioned it, and it is easy to get up and talk about individual hobby horses in this chamber when it comes to individual constituency projects. It is easy done. We, we, have all, we have all been guilty of it in the past. But the issues in which I mention here today are issues of real prioritisation for us all, collectively, in Northern Ireland to try and create economic condition, conditions post-COVID that can see uh, the rising tide lift all boats in the Northern Ireland PLC. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Dr Kiva Archibald. Good morning, and I have to say I didn't know there was ambiguity about your title. So.
Um, it's only three weeks since I spoke on the committee's behalf in the 2020-21 budget debate on the 5th of May. Um, and as so many members have said, and I suspect we'll be saying it for some time to come, we are living in exceptional times and can no longer apply the rule book to which we have referred for so long. The Economy Committee finds itself right at the heart of scrutinising measures put in place by the Economy Minister and her executive colleagues, including the Finance Minister. The Committee's position is in some ways unique among statutory committees in that we can see and hear firsthand the evidence of the economic devastation that the human tragedy of the COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it. But members have also been heartened by the evidence that we have received from a range of bodies and organisations highlighting how in recovering and rebuilding our economy and society we can create new and better ways of doing things. The committee has been hugely impressed and deeply humbled that while organisations are coming to brief members um, on issues faced by their sectors, they are also designing and sharing visions of how we can move on and improve. There is very little in self-pity, which is a testament to the resilience and ingenuity of our people. The committee believes this newer, better way of doing things should reflect the lessons that we have learned from this terrible blight of COVID-19. We must rebuild in a way that respects our planet and makes better and safer use of our resources. That will mean investing in new green industries and jobs. It will mean building and capitalising on the local community efforts that have got us through this crisis. Localisation where possible, rather than globalisation at all costs, must guide us. Our communities have shown themselves to be resourceful and innovative. Businesses have been repurposed and social enterprises clearly the way forward in so many sectors and for so many businesses. The committee understands that the budget envelope that the executive has at its disposal is finite. However, members have heard from so many stakeholders how we can and should pay it better and in a more sustainable way. The committee would advocate on behalf of its extensive stakeholder base that the executive applies this budget in a creative way. The committee urges the executive to listen to the advice of the bodies, organisations and individuals who have the expertise to take our economy and society forward. Let us emerge from this dark time to a new economy where we take the lessons we have learned and budget accordingly. Budget scrutiny at this point remains difficult, as I said on the 5th of May. The committee remains extremely supportive of the Department and Executive's COVID-19 response, and members will continue to advise both on gaps and issues as well as ideas and solutions going forward. The committee continues to stand ready to scrutinise the Department's budget as and when there is greater detail and certainty. It remains the committee's view that the Department for the Economy must have its budgetary needs prioritised. The committee looks forward to the outcome of the June monitoring round to better assess where the budget uh, position sits for the Department. At the same time, the committee is continuing to consider the impact of Brexit and the impact of the protocol on the local economy. This still requires significant budgetary support. Um, and I'll, I'll make a few remarks now in my capacity as Sinn Féin, uh, Sinn Féin economy spokesperson. And like others, I'll try not to repeat myself and speak in more broad terms in relation to the budget, because I think all of us recognise the difficulty in trying to finalise a budget in the current context. Our budget was obviously already under pressure prior to this unprecedented crisis, particularly after the British government reneged on some of its financial commitments in the context of the New Decade New Approach Agreement. Those challenges remain, and we must all collectively continue to make the argument for investment in our public services public services that have been vital in the recent weeks and that have been stripped bare following a decade of austerity. The role of the essential workers who provide these public services must also be recognised and never again should we hear disgraceful talk of how some of these are low skilled. In the weeks ahead as we plan for economic and society, societal recovery and allocate budgets to departments um, to support that. And I agree with Mr Muir's comments about them needing to be coordinated and strategic and of the collaborative approach that we must take. It's my belief that we must do this on a set of core principles, enshrining workers' rights and reversing the trend of precarious work and zero hours contracts, building on the new ways of working that we've all had to adopt in a very short time, remote and flexible working that can enhance work-life balance, is more environmentally friendly by reducing commuting and promotes regional balance by having people in their own communities more often. This will obviously require investment in digital infrastructure and other infrastructure um, to support remote working. We must ensure decarbonisation is one of the core tenets of the recovery and that we build on the sectors that have been able to expand during this crisis as well as export, supporting other sectors to recover. Skills development obviously will, must be part of that. There were a number of progressive commitments and principles agreed to in the in New Decade New Approach Agreement, including directing resources on the basis of need and tackling regional imbalance, 
These must guide our investment in the, way for, in the time ahead. A Green New Deal was also committed to. Other members have referred to this as well. It would be shameful not to ensure that our recovery also addresses the climate and biodiversity crises. We must harness the potential of our island in investing in green skills development and infrastructure to tackle structural inequalities as well as the climate emergency. And we need to look at how we can address multiple priorities and strategic outcomes. The Minister himself has talked about how he has asked departments to look at the capital programmes. Government can certainly play an important role in stimulating the construction sector and local economy through major capital bills. There are projects like McGee Medical School, Casement Park and others, as well as renewable energy projects that should be expedited. Conversations are already happening and concerns being expressed about how we are going to pay for this pandemic. It is a topic that governments around the world are grappling with. This is an extraordinary economic crisis brought about by a health emergency. It must have an extraordinary response. And one thing that's absolutely certain is that we cannot have a return to austerity in the aftermath of this. That would simply compound the disaster. Uh, one suggestion I had, and I've written to the British Chancellor on this, and perhaps the Minister could take it up also, is to tighten up tax slip pulls so big companies and the super rich are paying their way. Many of these have benefited from the government's unprecedented interventions, so they should pay their way in the time ahead also. But those companies who benefited from this crisis with increased profits and share prices should be subject to a windfall tax, and the revenue generated can be directed to support our vital public services. Suddenly switching off the funding for interventions like the job retention scheme will result in huge numbers of redundancies and will quite simply mean the interventions to date have been in vain. Further financial and fiscal stimulus is the only way to bring about an economic recovery in the shorter rather than longer term. The British Government must recognise this, and we collectively, as an Executive and Assembly, together with civic society, business organisations, academia, community and voluntary trade unions, must make the case for the type of support our local economy needs. We must continue to look at how um, we as an island can recover by investing in and supporting our local supply chains. The fragility of global supply chains and relying too heavily on imports has been exposed in recent weeks. There is a potential across the island to be more self-sufficient, and we must grasp that. We have seen how quickly some businesses have repurposed to produce vital PPE, for example, and they must be commended for those efforts. We must support other businesses to be innovative also. I, I agree with um, Mr O'Toole's comments, and I, I always agree when he makes the point in relation to the, the fiscal powers. I believe we should be continuing to argue for a devolution of further fiscal powers. I know the, the Finance Minister has talked before about setting up a commission. I think this is something that should be factored into your recovery plans. In bringing my comments to a close, as economy spokesperson, I can't but mention the huge concern that remains on our immediate horizon, and that's Brexit and the negotiations that are continuing. It is vital that the British Government provides further details on how it intends to implement the protocol as a matter of urgency. However, it is clear also that the clock is quickly ticking down towards the end of June, and there is much to do both practically and legislatively in relation to that as yet uncertain outcome. An extension to the deadline is the only sensible option at this point. This pandemic and our experience of it, and let's face it, it has changed all of us individually and as a society. These experiences must shape our economy and society for the better, building on our resilience and solidarity as a community. I support the bill. Mr. Gordon Dom. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too welcome the opportunity to speak on the second stage of the budget bill here today, which no doubt has been incredible and challenging times for us all. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone right across Northern Ireland, and it is vital that we all play our part in recovery and in the rebuilding process. Our economy has faced a very difficult period, and there are certainly very serious financial challenges for every executive department going forward. There has been a significant level of financial support measures put in place, and it is, I think, important that we recognise this, to support our local economy. And I would commend the work of the Executive, including our Finance Minister and, of course, our Economy Minister, Diane Dodds, who has recognised these challenges and who they have all fought, to, fought and su supported our many sectors as possible, with their infinite resources that are available to them. These measures, which include the 10K grant scheme, 
which has been issued over 20,000 payments, worth £194 million, and the 25 k grant scheme, the self-employed income support scheme, the job retention furlough scheme, and the recently announced micro-business hardship fund. And of course, the, the various bank lending schemes are also welcome, and the rates relief scheme, especially for businesses. And I do recognise, I think, that there is further clarification on who it is applicable uh, to in relation to the business relief. I continue to have inquiries from my constituents on that issue, and I think further clarification is required on what businesses it is applicable to. The agriculture, farming and fisheries support schemes have also been instrumental in supporting our local economy through certain these difficult days. We have benefited from one of the best economic rescue packages I believe in the world, being part of our United Kingdom and through our executive we have been able to do what is best for Northern Ireland. As we look forward to life after lockdown, we must work with our business sector to support them in the days ahead. And I know many businesses are keen to hear on the next steps on when they can reopen their doors. We have seen the Prime Minister outline the next steps to allow non-essential retail stores to be open from June 15 in, in England. And I know our executive will continue to be guided by the scientific and medical advice as to when they can be done here safely. There is a desire for clarity and certainty and also to give hope through the next small steps on our road to recovery and doing what is right for the people of Northern Ireland. The Step 1 announcement last week was a very welcome development for many as the first major step forward on our journey to recovery with the lifting of a range of lockdown restrictions. It is important that the Executive prioritises support for our manufacturing sector as a return to business in a safe, hygienic manner whilst retaining high quality standards. This will involve internal restructuring for many and revising production processes, which will have a significant impact on their production capability with reduced staffing levels and resources at any time. Remaining competitive and cost effective is a major challenge for them on the way forward for all our local manufacturing sector as they endeavour to compete globally. Our hospitality, our retail, leisure and tourism sectors, including our hotels, also need continued support on the road to recovery, as many hotels continue to lie empty. Indeed, within my own constituency, I can name a few. The Culloden Hotel, the Clandyboy Lodge and the Marine Court Hotels are all lying empty today. Whilst there are many challenges ahead, I believe there are opportunities, not least for our tourism sector, and I feel we must tap in to the demand for, holiday, for holidaying at home this year and in the years ahead, within Northern Ireland, helping to support and rebuild our local economy, whilst we live around the ongoing challenges that COVID-19 presents. Promotion of holidaying at home is something I believe needs support from Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland and looking at promotion of event tourism once again in the near future, which will be, has been so successful in the past in showcasing the very best of Northern Ireland on the world stage. Our town centres will also need support, as we are all very much aware, in the days ahead as they reopen their doors on a phased basis. We need to encourage local people back into our towns and cities and villages across Northern Ireland, buying and supporting local is crucial for our recovery and for our local economy to rebuild and gain confidence. Our local councils, as we have heard today, are keen to continue to build on relationships with central government in helping to stimulate the market in our town centres as places to visit and to do business. The Economy Committee, has, as the Chair has already mentioned, has engaged in a wide range of sectors over recent weeks and months, and as recently as this morning, we had a session with Nilga and Solis, representatives from our local councils, who rightly recognised the challenges for upskilling and developing our people to face the challenges of unemployment and the lack of opportunities, including for our young people in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. We also recognised the need for support for our universities 
and our colleges going forward, which is vital as we want to retain uh, the young people, our skilled and ambitious young people in the, for the future. There is no doubt there are many challenges ahead for our country and for our executive, not least financially, as we have been reminded about within the budget debate today. But I believe there are opportunities, and we must all play our part in supporting our recovery through the five-step plan and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr. Colum Gildernew. I just want to say a few words, and, and I don't propose to repeat my remarks from earlier. Um, and I do want to, uh, just before I start out, just uh, declare an interest in relation to my own role previously as a social worker, and uh, I was still on a career break from that, and also my wife being a, a nurse in the community. And I found the debate today very interesting in terms of, of the uh, the very often the reference to austerity, and I think that never has the, the, the saying that austerity cost lives been writ so large as it is at this particular time. Um, and in relation to remarks earlier that we should be grateful somehow to, to what we received from across the water and things like that, I want to bring members' minds back to the start of this pandemic. And as we watched this coming across the globe towards us, we saw it in Japan. Um, Italy had its first two cases on the 31st of January. We recorded our first case here on the 27th of February. And at that time, the pandemic stockpiles of PPE were held across the water. And from the 27th of February to the 6th of April, we didn't receive a single piece of PPE. Six weeks. And during that six weeks, I'm sure every member of this House, like me, took numerous and multiple calls from terrified care workers and domiciliary care workers and nurses who were afraid, literally, for their lives, for their families' lives and health, and for their, their, their patients' lives. And we all know what that was like at that particular time. And that was as a result of the public health preparedness being stripped out of the system because of austerity. Stockpiles in England were allowed to become depleted. Uh, times were allowed to expire on many of the important items, and whenever they were needed, they weren't simply there. On top of that, the testing infrastructure that was once here and was once across many Euro European nations was totally stripped down. We had the capacity to do 40 tests a day here when the pandemic hit. We had totally dismantled our contact tracing systems. Our public health doctor systems throughout the North had been reduced and diminished. And that has all had an impact. And I think it's vital that we recognise that. And when we hear today that we should be uh, removing blinkers, I actually agree with that statement, but probably for, for a different reason. Because I think we need to remove the blinkers of austerity to provide proper public health and social care for all our people. We need to support and value our frontline staff right across the board and across all grades, including domiciliary care. I will. I thank the member for giving way. I respect his, uh, his ability to do so. Does the member through the chair, does the member not realise that, let's say, if it wasn't for austerity, that money would actually be spent on PPE? Would money actually be spent on ventilators? Because that would have been a political policy direction, a decision that would have to be made. And the member opposite, like his party, talks and echoes all the time about Tory austerity, but never once do they mention the terrorist campaign that raged here for 30-odd years. How many ventilators could have been purchased with the money that was spent rebuilding our cities and towns. The member will recognise that that had absolutely no impact on the fact that we had 2,800 2, nurses short here in our system whenever this pandemic hit, along with all those other items that I have mentioned. So we need to start properly supporting and valuing what we now recognise as our actual real essential workers. Domiciliary care workers, porters, receptionists, social workers, nurses, doctors, all throughout the entire system. We need to tackle health inequalities and poor mental health. We absolutely must transform the health service and reform adult social care, and we need to provide proper support for our invaluable and indispensable and our absolutely hard-pressed and overworked informal carers who have picked up once again much of the burden of this emergency. 
So, in short, we need to work together here to provide proper public services and resources to care for all our people, to prosper as an economy, and to prepare for future public health crises, which reflects our needs here on this island. I support the bill. Thank you. I call Ms. Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. As I mentioned in previous budget debates, um, it has been absolutely impossible to ad adequately scrutinise this budget as we are trying to do so in the evolving crisis. And Minister, I would concur with your assessment that the current budget process has not been ideal. And I also agree, agree with the previous speakers that we need to get to a place where we can align long-term uh, budgets with a well-thought-out, coherent programme for government that is people-based and place-based and that drives prosperity, but also social well-being. Uh, and we look at, at, at sub-regional targets. Um, it's very hard to kind of have a, a new speech when we've done so many on these budgets where we're continually repeating ourselves, to be honest, but um, I suppose politicians are used to doing that quite regularly. <laughs> but um, this morning, one important news story was largely overlooked amidst the whole anger over uh, Dominic Cummins' refusal to resign. But it was a story that for businesses here and workers here in Northern Ireland that was much more important. The British government is nowhere near ready in the training of 50,000 new custom agents needed to deal with Brexit. Can I remind the Chamber that we are little more than half a year away from this really biting point of Brexit, just over 240 days. The Prime Minister may have boasted about getting Brexit done, but the real impact will hit Northern Ireland at the end of December when the trans transition period comes to an end. Of course, the Prime Minister could decide to extend that transition period, and that is what he should do. But just as he won't sack Dominic Cummings, he, he says he absolutely will not extend the Brexit transition period, despite this being the obvious and sensible thing to do. So we in the North, the region most affected by Brexit remain unclear about what customs arrangements will be in place. But it does seem that there won't be enough trained custom agents to help us to know about them, whatever they are. While COVID-19 is in the immediate term a complete disaster for the economy, we should not overlook the reality of Brexit over the longer term. This is likely to be a complete disaster for our economy. What makes it worse is that with just a few months to go, we in the region most affected have know so little about what comes next. Absolutely disgraceful. And it is almost as if Downing Street cares little about Northern Ireland, whatever the Prime Minister has said on private visits here in the past. But we do have one certainty, though, which is that the UK will have to focus more on growing our own talent and skills, relying less on migrants coming here to work. So we will have to invest more in skills and on training, and that be, must be one of our investment priorities. Which brings me to the subject closest to my heart and very closest to the interests uh, of the people in my foil constituency, and that is the McGee Medical School. I met virtually, of course, yesterday with senior members of uh, the representatives from Ulster University. I left the meeting with the sense that they were as in the dark of what happens now regarding progressing the business case for the medical school as we are in Northern Ireland about the new customer arrangements about Brexit after Brexit. Deputy Speaker, we need to know what is going on. We need more detail and we need greater transparency. That applies to the British government's plan for Brexit, but it also applies to the plans of our own government, the executive office and the senior officials when it comes to the McGee Medical School. The medical school is due to open its doors in September 2021, and I, like every other elected rep and, and everybody in the city, was delighted at the announcement. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done for this to take place, and it needs to be done very quickly and with a sense of urgency. And I urge the joint first ministers to proceed at pace. I also will support the second stage of this budget. Thank you. 
I call Mrs. Karen Mullen. Um, as a new member, uh, I found this debate very interesting and beneficial today. Um, so, when we last debated the budget bill here in, earlier in the year, we could not have foreseen the devastating impact uh, that COVID would have had. We were very concerned with addressing 10 years of austerity and ensuring that we had the funds that would be available to deliver on the commitments that was made in the new decade, new approach. Today's vote on account will allow departments to spend money to deliver our public services and begin the process of rebuilding our economy. Public services like our education system. In order to plan for reopening of schools, the department will need resources to do this, but must also look within its own budget to areas of work that have not happened in this period and reprofile money to provide support to our children and young people returning to school and to support their mental health and well-being. The childcare sector is almost decimated. We need to ensure that the sector is supported to reopen, provide sustainability and support parents back to work. A programme for government and the new decade new approach commits the executive in this assembly to deliver services and resources based on objective need and to tackle regional disparities. And I suppose, it, unfortunately, you've got two dairy representatives speaking after one another, so we're obviously very uh, passionate about where we come from, but also delivering on the projects um, that has been uh, worked on for many, many years. So the recent announcement of match funding for Dairy City and Shaban inclusive growth deal and the future fund alongside the executive commitment to opening of the medical school at McGee are examples of what can and should be done. Following the financial crash of 2008-2009, austerity became the default position of the rich and powerful across the world. Working class people bore, bore the burden while bankers and speculators walked away. When we emerge out of COVID-19 health and financial crisis, we cannot return to the default position of austerity and heap the cost on the poor and low paid. Poverty is not a fact of life and there should not be an acceptable level of poverty. We have it in our gift to put the eradication of poverty at the heart of everything we do here. In supporting of the budget bill area too, and as I stated earlier, the past 10 weeks we have had to learn to adapt and work together. So let's carry that forward and look to do things differently that ensures we protect workers and families. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr John Blair. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And, and may I begin by adding uh, my thanks to that expressed previously uh, to the Minister and to his officials for the work uh, done in, in recent weeks in response to a major crisis. And I hope that, um, as well as other messages here today, when the, the Minister leaves us, Principal Deputy Speaker, he will take away the message as well to his officials that um, all of us, I'm sure, even when we're not getting the answers we want immediately, even when we're making further demands on behalf of those who are in need, um, we are massively indebted to those officials for how they have swung into action and dealt with this crisis at this time, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise primarily as uh, Alliance spokesperson for agriculture and environment, and I want to address two issues that are important and, and urgent. And I do that in, in, in mindful of the uh, financial commitment that has been required already in relation to COVID and, of course, the necessary post-COVID planning as well. But there are urgent issues, and I am going to highlight two of them. The first of which is we know that, as clarified in a recent GB government report, that the forthcoming Northern Ireland Protocol, an integral part of the withdrawal agreement, will require, without doubt, expanded infrastructure at ports in Northern Ireland. This requirement, of course, relates to checks on animal and food products coming here from GB. Now, quite separate from our thoughts or opinions on the journey that got us to this point, or indeed the current circumstances themselves, preparations for this protocol and its pending implementation are absolutely essential. It is surely reasonable to expect, Principal Deputy Speaker, that provision is being made and that checks are in place within the Department of Finance to ensure that there is capacity for this 
what is a considerable upscaling from the current arrangement at ports around uh, live animals only. Hopefully the Minister uh, in his response today can provide some detail on the plan provision for this, especially in relation to the expected additional staffing costs involved and arrangements to ensure that the necessary staff resources are in place. If I could turn now to the environment, Principal Deputy Speaker, I would like to refer to executive commitments earlier this year, which understandably raised expectations in terms of imminent action to tackle climate change. New Decade New Approach brought us uh, the promise, and I quote, the executive will tackle climate change head on, with a strategy to address the immediate and longer term impacts of climate change. This pledge, listed in the published agreement under executive priorities, was accompanied by a pledge also to bring forward a Climate Change Act. Now, recent much reported environmental improvements, less traffic, re- reduced pollution, albeit at a time of unique and challenging circumstances, have demonstrated clearly that change can be made. That change thus far, however, has been circumstantial rather than policy driven. So, to harness the short term and recent gains in air quality, it would be reassuring to see firm, coordinated departmental commitment backed by budgetary provision to ensuring that the pledges previously given are fulfilled. Principal Deputy Speaker, we know that this will require collaborative efforts across the department, not least of all from DERA and infrastructure and economy. No commitment is required for financial provision, and I hope the Minister can refer to that later. There will be going forward opportunities as well to work with others in this regard, including through the recently established all-party group and climate change chaired by my colleague Rachel Woods there. Um, though those involved in that work will want to see commitment with policy and budgetary detail. Perhaps the Minister can offer this insight when he responds and can assist, hopefully, in the coordination of this commitment across departments to give some indication of the necessary funding has been requested from others, if it is being provided and if it can meet the commitments declared. The matters I highlight, Principal Deputy Speaker, can be argued are one political, uh, one, one natural, but both involve imminent changes which will affect all of us. I am hoping the Minister will clarify today that, that necessary measures and finances are in place, and perhaps they are hidden in the detail that was mentioned a number of times earlier, but we know they are needed to deal with this issue, these issues seriously and soon. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Declan Matalou. Um, Kama Agat, Prilas Concordia. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, commend the Minister for bringing the budget before us here today, particularly in the context of a very serious global pandemic, the COVID crisis. Um, I'd particularly like to turn my attention to welcoming the funding that he recently provided for the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to help offset the impact of the um, academic or the pandemic on the agriculture and the horticulture sectors. sectors. The £25 million in particular has been very, very warmly welcomed uh, by the sector. And we had the uh, DERA minister before us at the committee on Friday. And um, you know, from listening to him and indeed reading some of the public statements since the funding was announced, uh, it would appear that the priority sectors appear to be the, the dairy sector and the, the beef sector and indeed the horticultural sector. But I have to say that I have been approached, and like many other MLAs, by farmers from the beef and sheep sector who uh, have been fact- affected gravely by this pandemic. Um, I should say that 80 per cent of all farms in the north are beef and sheep farms, or the 25,000 farms are in the north, 20,000 are beef and sheep farms. And they have experienced a very severe um, price drop as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic and indeed the increase in co- in- input costs. And we've received various reports um, which have indicated that cattle, for example, have increased by uh, in the region of £230 a head, lambs by in the region of over £30 a head. And for many of these farms, they're also in the ANC areas, areas of natural constraint. And they have to, these farms also have to contend with the loss of the ANC payment this year. And many of the farms are are quite small as well, and they they struggle to benefit from the other schemes, such as the Self-Employed Income Support Scheme. And that was something that I alluded to earlier in in the speech, where it would be important that many of these farms, which fall through the cracks of the other schemes, can uh, be um, 
supported by this funding. And indeed, it is a long road to recovery, and we got a report from the Livestock Meat Commission just uh, last week, and in it it said it's a long road to business as usual. Um, this budget has also been made in the context of uh, Brexit, Brexit, which uh, overshadows a lot of it. And unlike the COVID pandemic, this wasn't something that was um, like a, if you want to call it a natural disaster. It was this was deliberate action, deliberate action by English right-wing Tories, who have very little regard to here. Uh, and I'm saying that in the context that the majority of people here in the north did not vote to um, leave the European Union. But one of the consequences of it from an agriculture and rural perspective is that we have been removed from the common agriculture and policy. And that has thrown into jeopardy future funding for farm support beyond the lifetime of the, the, the current Westminster Parliament, which we have been told that the funding is secured until then, but after that we just don't know. That also applies to the Pillar 2, the Rural Development Programme as well, and we all know from our communities the importance of the Rural Development Programme, particularly the Priority 6 of the Rural Development Programme, for funding our rural community groups, for the building of community hubs, infrastructure, village renewal. That's also going with leaving the EU, and I commend the Minister who has been uh, lobbying the, the British Government in rela relation to the UK Shared Pros Prosperity Fund, because it was the British Government that removed us from the EU with the consequent loss of that funding, so it should be the British government who should replace that lost funding through the EU, their UK Shared Prosperity Fund. And I welcome the fact that the Minister has been lobbying the British government in respect to that there. Um, turning back to something which is really critical and is connected to Brexit and connected to the future um, well-being and good of the industry here, the failure by the British government two weeks ago to support an amendment to the Agriculture Bill which was brought in by Neil Parrish, who is the, who is the chair of the EFRA committee in Britain. This amendment would have prevented low standard food imports from countries which have lower welfare and environmental standards for, from coming into Britain. Now, this will further undermine the industry and indeed decimate the British market. And the British market is really important for uh, farmers from here. You know, 75% of our beef is exported into the British market. But if the, because Britain itself is only 58% self-sustainable. But if we had a situation where, Brit, where Britain then entered into trade deals around the world with countries of lower environmental standards, lower, lower animal welfare standards, cheaper food, which floods that market over there, it will destroy the market for our farmers here, and it will completely decimate farming in Britain. But perhaps that is the strategy anyway, because we recall a number of months ago there was a leaked memo from the some senior Tory, which indicated that they wanted to run down farm food production completely and turn Britain into like a Singapore, where they in, uh, import all of their, their food. So that was a, that was a very serious um, blow two weeks ago when the farming union here, indeed the farming unions uh, across the water in Britain, were, were devastated. They felt there was a slap in the teeth to uh, uh, the, our hard-pressed farming industry that worked so well to build up the industry here. This uh, has also been compounded by the failure of the British government to make, pressure, make any progress on implementing the, the protocol, the EU protocol. And this uh, technical note, which we got just last week uh, through the committee, uh, from, uh, it's a technical note which was prepared by the EU Commission, said in it that um, um, if, if the current existing posts are maintained as the end of the transition period, there will be no entry point solution in Northern Ireland for live animals and for products of animal origin. Now, that's a very, very serious situation as we're moving into this transition period. We don't have some arrangement for this. There will be no points of entry for, uh, for our, our markets here. And that, that, that could be devastating for the industry here. So the point I'm saying is that the, you know, the, um, the British government have let down their farmers, sold out their farmers. And people are quite right to extol the benefits of the union. That's their, their belief. But that is what the British government has done to farming, both across the water and potentially here. Uh, it's, uh, they've run down farmers, uh, their farmers in their function as food producers. And as this uh, COVID pandemic highlight, hi highlights, a local so secure food supply line is crucial, particularly in times of crisis. And, and it's, it's shocking that that amendment wasn't, wasn't accepted a couple of weeks ago. So, in conclusion, I want to support um, this budget. 
uh, we recognize that the executive has uh, a restricted envelope of funding at their disposal. And to support the minister in, in his efforts, uh, both in the executive and um, on behalf of the executive, impressing the British government and the EU for the necessary additional funding to support our agri-food businesses um, here. So uh, thank you very, very much for that and I commend uh, the, the budget. Mr Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I rise to contribute to today's debate on the incoming budget. But of course, I am fully uh, cognizant of the context in which we find ourselves uh, in light of the ongoing COVID pandemic. The pandemic has had a devastating impact on every part of our way of life. It has resulted in businesses having to make huge sacrifices in closing temporarily and also in throwing themselves at the mercy of various government departments in need of support. And the public has had to make its sacrifices in terms of social distancing and isolating themselves. And of course, we're hearing that there is another recession and that it's hurtling its way towards us. And that is to say nothing of the democratic deficit it has created in this House, uh, in which our role as elected legislators has been radically altered and indeed restricted. Uh, and thankfully, though, we are beginning to see a return to some sense of normality, be that even just the new norm. And the context of the North is, and has been for many years, is divided one. And therefore, we need to see now, more than ever, a renewed sense of reconciliation. And the budget will play an essential part in addressing how we begin to put the North back together again, following years of stagnation, stalemate and disruption. Um, the architects and peacemakers of 98 certainly understood that and understood that our response to the critical matters of the day in times of exceptional circumstances cannot be addressed by limiting response to their own individual constituencies. We must always have the bigger picture in mind. This reconciliation was sadly hindered by newspaper articles appearing in the South this weekend past and in GB where it would appear that there is at least one government aid that is ready to take the legislation surrounding COVID-19 into his own hands. The people of the North need to have their faith in their government and to know that their government has their best interests at heart. The people of the North need to have a sense of purpose, a job and some hope uh, to have their individual dignity afforded to them. Our response, our investment, our budget cannot be for the benefit of one group of people, but must be for all people. For all of our healthcare workers, for our teachers, for those that are unable to work, and for our emergency services, and indeed more. If this budget is not for the benefit of all, then we will have failed. I want to reflect on some of the spending that will impact the areas uh, that I've been following through some of my committee work. The victim's payment is an issue that is causing concern at the present time. This was mentioned in the New Decade New Approach document and to date has not been progressed. And this is causing worry and concern to people on the ground. These victims have suffered enough. We need to do the right thing and deliver this pension payment to them. They have already lost enough and made enough of a sacrifice in their lives. The legislation has been approved, but we need to see the delivery. And I do not believe that this is a payment that this executive should have to make on its own, but it is one that needs to be made. The British Parliament made the bill, and the British Exchequer should foot the bill. And this scheme includes people from beyond these shores, and it should not be left to the block grant of the North to pay. I welcome, too, that this year's budget includes payments for those impacted by historical abuse. Uh, this was a travesty of our past and one that is being addressed in a small way in the payments from this scheme. I would welcome continued work going forward to secure from the institutions that were responsible uh, for the abuse, as this will help the balance sheets within the department in respect of the money. We are all too aware of the budget cuts that have left our public services and staff in a difficult financial hardship, and I believe that those who have been affected by these cuts could benefit uh, from much needed investment and financial relief. This is to say nothing of the fact that these institutions were failed for three and a half years, which left uh, portfolios abandoned and vital projects 
shelved, and most shamefully, public trust in elected officials uh, decimated. Now is the time to prove that these institutions can work and that they will deliver for the public. Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I am also a member of the Assembly's Health Committee. I want to make a few brief remarks in relation to the funding for our health and social care system. The Health Service has received an uplift in this budget, uh, which is not only welcome, but entirely necessary. Our Health Service has suffered greatly from a decade of austerity, which we know was a political choice. It was less than six months ago that our nurses and key workers had to stand in the rain for pay parity. If one small positive thing comes out of this pandemic, let it be the long-awaited recognition uh, of the importance of these workers. Never again should they have to strike for fair pay and conditions. I also want to make another point on health, and it is in relation to mental health. Uh, the Minister launched the Mental Health Action Plan uh, last week, and that is very welcome. But the strategy is yet to be launched, uh, or that is yet to be launched must be properly resourced. The Minister for Health, supported by executive colleagues, must consider a pandemic payment in our mental health and bereavement services to deal with the looming crisis that will come as a result of coronavirus. As I have said, we have been hit with a worldwide pandemic, and I appreciate and understand the massive impact that this will have on the budget process and the monies that the executive and departments will have to spend going forward. We need to see a joined-up strategic budget that is flexible enough to respond to emerging need, but also that addresses priorities equally. It was a criticism of budgets past that allocations were disproportionate and favoured larger parties' departments. And I think that that would be a crass move now, and one that we certainly are not prepared to accept, and will highlight and act should we see it happening. We need to match our spending to a set of coherent policies. It is incredibly important that our budget should be linked to a long-term vision for our public services and our economy beyond this crisis. I do not think there is much evidence yet of such a coherent policy. And I would be interested in the Minister's thoughts on developing such. We need also to be prepared for the impact of Brexit. This was once cited as the Department officials as being the matter of their sole attention, um, and that preparation was being undertaken by them, was consuming them in everything they did. Uh, that obviously has stopped because of coronavirus and has had to take a back seat and become the number two priority within departments. It is folly to accept that by not preparing for something properly that you are ready for it. By definition, it is almost impossible. Uh, we are suggesting and continuing to suggest that there should be an extension sought. This does not require a compromise of politics. It requires the promise of using common sense. I would ask the Minister uh, for his department's understanding and assessment of where he feels the preparations for the executive departments are, and whether or not an extension would be worthwhile. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, in summation, now is the time to begin our journey for a joined-up and a strategic budget. We have to do it now. This will be a year in which we have shown our capacity for compassion in how we have responded to the ongoing COVID uh, crisis. And I welcome the news today that there have been no recorded COVID-19 deaths in the last 24 hours, and thank God for that. But this can also be a year in which we can distribute our resources to the places that need them most in a strategic manner. Now is the time for a budget that works for people, for communities, for business, and for the North as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Cathal Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. First, I would like to state some of the pressures the Department of Infrastructure has been facing for a number of years, as it is important to demonstrate the structural failings of austerity. Every member's constituency most likely gets countless issues regarding their roads, which has been operating on the skeleton service in recent history as a result of departmental cuts to budgets. This not only includes potholes, street light repairs and gritting. This service, before budget cuts, used to get around £35 million a year, but now receives half of that. 
On this, I commend the scheme introduced by my colleague Chris Hazard in his tenure as Infrastructure Minister to target the repair of rural roads via, via the Roads Recovery Fund. The legacy of this initiative is that in the last two years the Department has allocated some £25 million to a Roads Recovery Fund or RF, that mostly goes towards our rural roads. It is important that such a scheme continues and will hopefully inspire the Department to further invest in similar schemes. Meanwhile, our coveted rural community transport partnerships have faced stark cuts in their budget in recent years. Last year's budget allocation represented a reduction of almost 20 per cent in the overall baseline since 2015-16. Community transport groups who are currently facing some pressure as a result of COVID-19 have been concerned that they have only received a letter of offer for three months. And on top of this, they have lost a significant amount of revenue via group hire work throughout this pandemic. It is most important that the Infrastructure Minister fully engages with the community transport moving forward as they provide an invaluable service to communities and continue to do so during COVID-19 by helping with essential journeys and deliveries. The lack of proper funding throughout the years due to austerity have left departments in a vulnerable position to respond to events such as COVID-19. These are not normal circumstances for a budget, and the reality is that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic cannot be held within the confines of conventional departmental budgets. We need to have a comprehensive perspective when looking at our response to this pandemic. All departments, through you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, are facing significant pressures right now. But it is important to realise that instead of allocating funding on a departmental basis, the funding to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic has been agreed by the executive as a whole on a needs basis instead. The pressures we currently face as a result of COVID and austerity has been compounded by the failure of the British Government to honour their commitments within the new decade, new approach. It is noteworthy that one of these commitments was turbocharging infrastructure and mentioned vital projects such as improving the Belfast to Dublin Rail, the A5, A6 and the Narrow Water Bridge. This also included included assisting in investing in our essential sewage infrastructure, which is a crucial issue across the North, as around 100 areas have some capacity issues regarding sewage infrastructure. No drains, no cranes is the same in NA water, and this needs to be addressed fairly across the North to allow balanced regional growth and tackle inequalities. Brexit continues to overshadow everything that we do and presents other economic problems down the line. For sectors, for sectors such as haulage and logistics, who are currently facing massive pressures due to COVID, this is a very worrying time indeed. And this is only worsened by the British Government not heeding the calls by so many for an extension to the current Brexit deadline. And while all of these issues, which I have previously alluded to, are ongoing, such as austerity, COVID-19 and Brexit, it is, important, it is important to remember that addressing the climate change emergency also has to remain a priority. Any economic strategy to recover from this crisis caused by COVID-19 must be based on a just transition towards a net zero carbon economy. This includes tackling congestion and pollution levels and committing to decarbonising our transport network and travel behaviour. Yes, certainly. For the member for giving way, just um, reflecting what he said earlier on about um, that allocations have been made, I think he said, on the needs rather than a departmental basis. He would, however, acknowledge that in order for money to be spent, it does have to go to a department at some point. Um, and in order to address some of the needs he talked about, including the crisis in Northern Ireland water and also moving towards active and, and green travel, that money will basically have to be allocated at some point to the Department for Infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. And as long as the Minister alluded earlier on, as, there, as long as the proposal brought forward 
to the executive, and then the executive will make a decision on that. The challenge ahead will no doubt be significant, and we need to identify how best to facilitate an economic recovery. Capital projects will have to will have a part to play in this goal. This adds a new dimension to the importance of some of the capital projects that need to be progressed as soon as possible, such as Casement Park and the A5. On this, the Department for Infrastructure is currently assessing their de- delivery capacity on capital projects this year as a result of COVID-19, and it is vital that it is revealed to members of the committee as soon as possible. Some of the projects I am sure that other members and their constituents are also t- keen to see progress, as well as myself, includes projects such as the Narrow Water Bridge and the Belfast to Dublin Railway improvements, as well as the F5 and F6, which I alluded to. Another project of importance includes the A1 junction safety improvements. This project means so much to so many people, especially those who have lost a loved one on this treacherous road. I think it is absolutely essential that this scheme is delivered as soon as possible. With regards to the City Deal funding, the £700 million funding announced by the Finance Minister in relation to City Deals is a huge plus for the North during this difficult period and should assist in progressing vital infrastructure schemes such as the Newry Relief Road and the second phase of the glider, to name but a few. In consideration of the vast challenges ahead, I commend the actions taken by the Finance Minister during this difficult period. This includes the total of £50 million additional funding for TransLink in recent months, as well as £60 million remaining in the Centre for Transport Issues. On top of this, the Department have received the biggest capital allocation in its history. The importance of, civ- of public services and the need to protect them has been one of overarching themes. One of the overarching themes of COVID-19, a crisis that has hi- highlighted the abhorrent dangers of a policy like Tor's- Tory austerity, and disregards the importance of core public services. It is crucial, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Principal Deputy Speaker, that we learn the lesson and it's not forgotten in the future. Thank you. I call Mr. Sinead Ennis. Um, Mr. Principal, De- Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his time today. And I welcome the opportunity to offer some thoughts on today's proceedings. Um, and I think, as other members have said, we do need to re- reflect on the difficult context with which the Minister brings this vote uh, on account to the Assembly. Um, because not only are we in the grip of the biggest health emergency in living memory, but the economic damage as a result of COVID-19 will no doubt weigh heavy on us all for a very long time to come. Um, and all of this would be bad enough in itself if it weren't set against the grim and ghoulish backdrop of years of British government and Tory austerity. And some people in this chamber don't want to talk about austerity. They don't want to hear us mention that word. It makes them feel uncomfortable. We make, make no apologies for it. Because Sinn Féin have been saying for years that austerity was bad for your health. And let me tell you, we take no pleasure in the fact that we have been proven right. The preparedness of the British government, I won't give way, the preparedness of the British government to deal with the global pandemic, such as the one we are now living through, was compromised as a direct result of their deliberate policy of austerity. Stripping money out of the NHS, refusing to pay nurses and other healthcare workers a decent living wage, deciding that PPE and other vital equipment was not high on their list of priorities, that these were aspects of the health service where they could save a few quid. These were all deliberate policy decisions made by the Tory Westminster Government of the day. It is my firm belief that here in the North, we have been lucky that we have the right ministers heading up the right departments at the right time. The fact that we have ministers like Conor Murphy in finance and Deirdre Hargey in communities who are actively and fundamentally opposed to austerity meant that this executive was able to move money and resources out the door and provide targeted interventions uh, to ensure that our citizens were supported. The citizen-centred and humanitarian approach of the Finance Minister ensured that departments had the necessary resources available to them to meet the mounting challenges posed by the COVID crisis. Notwithstanding the hundreds of millions of pounds provided to the Department of Health, this Minister has provided inter- inter- money for interventions such as the enhancement to the dis- discretionary support fund, £20 million in funding for our councils to offset the impact of COVID on them, 
410 million provided in business grants, 25 million for agriculture, as my colleague Declan McAleer has alluded to, um, and funding packages to support the charity sector um, and the community support, uh, uh, support scheme. And the list goes on. And for that, he surely must be commended. As the Finance Minister has already explained, before we were faced with the challenges of COVID, our Black Grant was already at pre-austerity levels. £360 million uh, pounds in real terms, as has previously, previously been said by other speakers. And my fear, and the fear of everyone I represent, is that this inept and cruel Tory government, in true Conservative style, will use this crisis not as a lesson in the importance of investing in public services, but as an excuse to inflict more austerity and more hardship on us and the communities we represent. Instead of a lurch towards more austerity, what we need to see is government centrally and locally spending money on capital and regeneration projects. Projects that will, re will revitalise our communities and act as drivers for our economy, hospitality and tourism sectors. The New Decade New Approach document, concocted by both the British and Irish governments and signed up to in good faith by all the parties around this chamber, raised the expectations of the public that investment in key projects and services would be forthcoming by the British Government. But in true perfidious Albion style, the British Government have thus far reneged on those commitments. We cannot allow the treachery of the British Government to infect the mindset of departments and of ministers. Now is the time for executive ministers to show leadership on issues like Casement Park. Only last month in the Committee for Communities, we learned that £4.5 million in ring fence capital funding for the Casement Park Sports Stadium project was surrendered in June 2019 and January 2020 monitoring rounds because of the continued unwillingness to make a decision on the plan and application. Eleven years, Gales and Antrim and Ulster are waiting on a permanent fit-for-purpose home to be built. A quarter of a million members of the GN Ulster without adequate stadium facilities is nothing short of a disgrace. And I wholeheartedly agree with the recent assessment by Belfast Solicitor Niall Murphy that the failure to deliver on Casement Park is now an equality issue. No, I won't. Thank you. All the potential for action since this Assembly has been restored and we now have a Minister in place is being squandered by the inaction of Minister Mallon. She is sleeping on the issue. She is sleeping on the issue and I would call on her to show some leadership. If there are still matters and problems in regards to uh, Casement Park uh, and she is still waiting on information, then she needs to step in. She needs to pull rank uh, and she needs to, as I say, show some leadership on that issue. From, no, I won't, thank you. From the outset of this global pandemic, I'm going to get these, this statement out by hook or by crook. From the outset of this global pandemic, prote protecting lives and livelihoods has rightly been the priority of the Finance Minister and his colleagues. Once this crisis has passed, and it will eventually pass, we must ensure projects like Casement, the sub-regional stadium project and of course Narrow Water Bridge and other revitalisation projects are advanced so that they can act as economic drivers that we will undoubtedly require in the post-COVID world. This crisis is unparalleled and there is an onus on all of us in this Assembly and especially on our Ministers to bring forward any and all measures that will support people and bolster public services at this time. And With that, I support the Bill. I call Mrs. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm not going to spend this um, speech criticising ministers. I would actually like to thank a minister. Um, the House has already agreed to supply a resolution for the, for the further vote on account. This allows existing services to continue until this legislation is passed, enabling funds to meet the balance of estimated expenditure for the rest or for this financial year. As we've heard today, this year's budget is a moving feast. Due to the coronavirus, the Finance Minister and the Executive have been allocated unprecedented amounts of funds to help citizens through this crisis. As the amounts are changing regularly, it makes it very difficult to a uh, uh, very difficult process to manage and report on. So I'd like to thank the Minister for actually getting us to this stage. Um, yes, we would have liked to have seen more detail, and yes, we would have liked to have seen it more uh, far earlier. But we have lost so many citizens throughout this crisis that it was right and proper to concentrate on them. As we know, earlier figures provided in the further vote and account 2020-2021 is the expenditure up until October 2020. What happens after October still needs to be clarified. Others have said it today, and I'll say it again, the budget is not set against an agreed programme for government. We await that document still from the executive. Most committees still await ministerial priorities. 
This virus has interrupted so much, but we should not allow it to distract us completely from those objectives that we all want to see have progressed. New Decade, New Approach had agreed priorities, many of which have not been brought forward yet. I am concerned that unless these priorities are detailed in a budget, they will not be able to progress in this term of office. For example, the review of education may not progress. That is not negotiable. There are reasons why some parties joined the executive, and some of those reasons are within the new decade, new approach. It is therefore vital that the budget includes investment required to deliver on those priorities. And I'll ask the minister in his summation what the thoughts are going forward on that. I appreciate the budget cannot provide the detailed information at this time. I know that we have an ever-changing picture as Barnet consequentials flow into departments here. I'm also mindful that Westminster can also decide to reduce spend in areas and that could have a negative consequence here. What do we know of plans moving forward? Are we going to be completely dependent on the whims of Westminster this year? I recognise that departments have huge costs at this time, but they also have many projects that are not being taken forward because of the coronavirus. I expect these savings will be identified and drawn back into the centre for reallocation in the monitoring round, and we'll hear about that in September, October. Due to necessity, committees have not been able to scrutinise details in a way that we should, and that has been called for in the RHI report. Sadly, we are again considering another one-year budget. I get it, we're in a crisis, but we need to plan our way out of this crisis. This is what government is, this is what leadership is about. During New Decade, we all agreed that we needed to have longer funding periods. We talked about three-year budgets. This virus has taken that ability away from us. Sadly, we expect some businesses to close, some people to be made redundant. We hope that this situation does not cripple us with huge hikes in future rates bills for the cost of construction to go through the roof, the cost of food and fuel to go up again. Mr. Frew mentioned earlier when he talked about the savings plans, and I concur. I agree that the executive should not just be spending money at this stage. It should be looking to see where are the savings and where can we spend that properly. I'd like to remind the minister and the executive that the committee, that committee's roles is not just to scrutinise but also to assist and support ministers. Committees can ask the question, so what? Is this project necessary? Is that really a priority? Do we have to spend the money now or can we programme it to be spent in the next year? We need to generate necessary savings that make this budget and for the rest of this year as effective and as efficient as possible. There are a number of key areas that others have talked about, but I'm going to highlight again, where we need investment. And I would ask the Minister to outline how he intends to take this investment forward after October the rest of the financial year. Northern Ireland Water, if we do not invest in our wastewater, then development will be hindered across Northern Ireland. As has been said before, in this chamber, without drains, there's no cranes. This must be a priority. If we don't sort out the pipes under the ground, then we will have new, no new homes and we cannot invest in construction. We will not deliver on those city deals programmes. Perhaps now is the time to look at innovative ways to fund necessary services. Alliance has spoken many times and has faced a lot of criticism, but we will, and I will say it again, Northern Ireland, need, Northern Ireland Water needs to be able to treat income differently to allow it to borrow to invest in our, our wastewater treatment system. If it isn't invested in, then there will be no cranes, and we will see even further economic crisis. TransLink, it's quite stark. If we don't invest in our public transport system, then we won't have a public transport system. I'm glad to see that much of the money for TransLink has been front-loaded this year. But what happens after October? Do we still have a company that's asked to wear down its reserves to the point of being bankrupt? Entrepreneurs. So far, the lack of support for those who are self-employed, who have taken the risk to set up their own businesses, sole traders, has been found wanting. 
Programmes such as Go For It may as well kiss that goodbye from now on. We will have a difficult time encouraging anyone to risk setting up their own business or become self-employed in the future. We will have a lot to do in coming months to encourage confidence in this government when those business owners feel so let down and left out. House building legislation is going forward to address the necessary reclassification of social housing. The amount of potential capital investment unspent in previous years has been shameful when we consider how many people are in housing stress. We have to invest in housing in order to meet and to facilitate the type of housing needed for society. The budget being brought forward needs to stop doing what we have always done and start delivering real opportunity, utilising money as efficiently as possible. One good thing that has actually come out of coronavirus is that we managed to meet head on the issue of homelessness. There needs to be the same commitment for the rest of this year to prevent homeless numbers rising again. Once lockdown relaxes, and we progress through the executive's phased plan, we must ensure that planning applications are progressed much, much more quickly, still within the rules, by councils, for contracts to be agreed and signed and to ensure commencement of new build projects. With regards to benefits, our mitigation measures will continue. We all agreed that this was a good thing, but we should be pushing DWP to bring forward managed migration into universal credit. We need to know if this will be brought forward in this financial year, as it means more costs will be met, allowing us to deliver on the poverty strategy aims whenever that strategy is brought forward. And this is where we come to the planning. We need the executive to get those strategies that will underpin what the budget should be spent on. We need to be more creative, less dependent on red tape and bureaucracy. We have businesses and organisations that can reach much more quickly and effectively, and this is why our contract and tendering systems need to be updated to allow social enterprises and local companies to deliver services that will not only deliver the service, but they will actually invest back into their local community and into society. We need in future the budget to learn from what we now know as a result of coronavirus. Our care in the community services need to be invested in to ensure we do not treat those who care for our most precious relations, older people, children, people with disabilities and those who are sick as cheap labour. That we invest in charities who support the community and we have all seen and have worked with those charities over the last nine weeks who quite frankly have helped to keep our community alive. The people who helped to deliver food parcels, who were the only voice who were calling that isolated person who was shielding, who looked after care workers' children, who volunteered and worked in care facilities, putting themselves at risk. Care homes care for many people who have nowhere else to live, yet the staff there received the lowest wages. Our health care staff went on strike to get fairer pay. I believe we need to learn from the coronavirus and to do things better and smarter for everyone who lives here. Perhaps it's time to reconsider society. Maybe we should consider providing a universal basic income and then we could address poverty. If we put people first in the budget planning process, then we can come out of this awful crisis with some hope for the future. So I ask you, Minister, to confirm if you can or you will ask ministers to ensure when providing future financial asks, they do so not just to provide services, but that those services will deliver positive change and progress for the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. We have already discussed the issues around the process that the Executive are pursuing with regard to this year's budget in the uh, further vote and account earlier on today. But there's another important issue to raise regarding the procedure of this bill, which had just been published and made available by email to members, and we're now debating it at second stage. The reasons for such a rush process had been put forward by the Minister, but the issue of why this Assembly is expected to vote on the principle of legislation on the same day that it has been laid before the House remains apparent to me. To ensure that legislation put forward by the Executive is adequately scrutinised, we should not accept such a procedure lightly, and it must not be the case that Ministers feel that they have the power to rush things through in this manner. Is it the case that we are in a position because of the limited number of sitting days that we have in the Assembly now, or is it the preferred option of the Executive to avoid difficult questions when members have had a proper chance to look at what is in front of them? It would be helpful to hear from the Minister on this point that the precedent the voting on legislation just after it has been published has on the work of the Assembly and that this should not happen again. 
I have raised some of the issues with the fact that we will not have the main estimates and a comprehensive evaluation of departmental spending until the autumn. This was also raised in the main budget debate earlier on this month, so I will not labour this point any further than it needs to be. But the Health Minister has just stated that the, in the executive briefing on COVID this afternoon that a second wave of this virus is ex widely expected in the months ahead. So do we have enough in reserves or contingency plans built in to deal with this? I would like to ask the Minister what plans he has. If we are in a second wave of this virus, with similar PPE requirement levels needed, similar lockdown requirements needed, with business closures that we have now, and are they being developed? I would like to turn to some of the gaps in the COVID-19 spending and the issue of a green economic recovery, which I mentioned in my earlier speech. Some members may have heard this before, but I do not apologise. As an opposition MLA, it must be continuously raised. These are both relevant to the bill, which sets in law and releases funds to the departments based on COVID-19 allocations published on the 19th of May. So with regard to our local councils, 20.4 million allocated by the Minister of Communities is welcome in order to try and initially cover losses and the pressures experienced by local authorities because of COVID. But there must be more. This is literally a drop in the ocean of what is needed. Our councils cannot become insolvent, but, so, insolvent, but some are dangerously close to it. Questions will not only need to be answered about the future of local government institutions, let alone what this will mean for schemes and plans that have been agreed and works begun on, what will this mean for the large capital projects? Will Council have to reprofile finances that were allocated to some to something completely different? Will large schemes be put on the long finger? How will this affect the provision of public service? Communities must not see cuts or closures as we come out of this pandemic. Local authorities across the UK have received funding commitments and local councils here need to be in the same pos position. The Minister has also stated that the Executive intends to absorb the cost of Council's lost income, but how? We don't have any details of this, and figures published in the COVID-19 alloca COVID allocations document don't add up. So how, Minister, does the in Executive intend to manage this? The economic impact of this pandemic is being felt without us entering into recession yet. This, on top of the uncertainty of Brexit, will be felt for years to come. And there are many businesses still falling through the gaps, and the impact on them will be much, much greater. The furlough scheme, which I mentioned earlier on, has been welcome, of course, to keep as many people in employment as possible, and it has been a lifeline for some sectors. If employers, though, who have not had any income since March are told to either bring your staff back to work if you can safely, if that's even possible, or on a part-time basis, and contribute to their wage packet, there will not be many businesses left. What if we are not in that stage of the executive plan? Will we have more people feeling that they have been forced back into the workplace before it is safe to do so? Will the executive be able to help those employees and the employers should this happen? Does the executive, in recognising the importance of the hospitality sector, amongst others, envision helping businesses financially if they cannot open safely, not at the appropriate stage of the plan, and are facing the only choice of making staff they have unemployed? As we know, not all businesses have received the same support. Some who are not eligible for other government grant schemes were being told that a hardship fund was on the way, only to find out that it did not apply to them, like sole traders. So yet again, they're waiting to hear if there's anything else for them to keep their business afloat or just make the minimum payments in order to keep them operating after this. So I also ask the Minister, is there anything left in the budget to help those that have been left out? Many members have been contacted by local charities eager to find out where they fit into government support and, would have welcomed the, and we welcomed the announcement of 15.5 million funds support them made on the 7th of May. Minister Hargey also announced that it would be launched very shortly on the 20th of May. It's now the 26th of May and in our ninth week of lockdown during which many traditional forms of fundraising for charities have been absolutely impossible. Are all charities and social enterprises in Northern Ireland supposed to avail of funding from this one pot to try and maintain key services? Because it won't be enough. The same organisations that help our most vulnerable people and others in our society, like working with animal welfare, are they the last to be, are they the last to be given support? During the budget scrutiny processes, committees were told that the executive is facing pressures in terms of departmental budgetary needs and in terms of delivering new decade near approach priorities. There is simply not enough funding to do all we aspire to do. This re raised questions from many on New Decade New Approach. As other members have outlined here, there have been some gaps in producing the estimated budgets aligned to NDNA priorities in some departments, as well as commitments made in this House. 
So I'll surmise then that the NDNA is something of a wish list, uncosted and therefore subject to being reprioritised, not just because of COVID, but just to be kicked down the line further. This Assembly declared a climate emergency earlier on this year, but there is certainly no emergency fund for this here. Perhaps it is time to have an open and honest conversation about it, given that there is less than two years left in this mandate, that we cannot have everything contained in it, and it will not be delivered this year or the next. I would like to turn to some of the inevitable issues arising from the lockdown to deal with the COVID pandemic now. These are not pressures that only came to light with the benefit of hindsight. The executive are well warned and aware of the worrying prospect that lockdown could lead to a rise in domestic violence and abuse, an increase in mental ill health and mental health issues, and of course the devastating economic impact of shutting down businesses and industry. This begs the question, why is there no dedicated strategy with appropriate resources and funding allocated to deal with domestic abuse at this time? What are the executive doing right now to deal with the seriousness about, around mental health? that many of our constituents are facing right now and for those who have addiction issues. Yet again, if, as we, we knew these things would all be difficult, then why was there no adequate financial resources allocated to comprehensive preventative strategies to deal with them? The executive response to these issues is still lacking and it's certainly something for the Minister to consider in budget allocations. So how does the bill and the budgetary process now pursued by the executive prepare us for what's coming down the line? I asked the same question of the budget allocation debated on the 5th of May. I don't believe it got a properly, properly answered, nor has it been answered here today. We know that an economic recession is inevitable. We know that not all businesses will survive, and this is an extremely difficult time. So what work is happening now to deal with the future of the economy? We were promised an economic recovery plan weeks ago, as was mentioned earlier on, and the minister indicated that it would be discussed by the executive this week, which is welcome. But I'd like to ask the minister if he's seen it what his assessment is of it, and if it can be resourced from the proposals before us today. What happens if it turns out the departments no longer have the adequate resources to deliver such a plan when the autumn comes? And will we in the back benches get to see it, or is this just confined to the five parties sitting around the executive table? Thank you. Good to know. We need a sustainable and fair and just recovery to get out of this. We need a plan, especially as we face economic recession, and not like the one that governments implemented after our last social and economic disruption through the economic crash in 2008, where we bailed out the banks, but actually to look to provide, the, provide stimulus through the components of the Green New Deal and bail out our people. It will not have quick fixes, but we need a long-term plan that does not penalise people by entering into austerity politics. If we believe the Tories who have said that austerity is not an option, this will require huge public expenditure. Mark Carney, who is the former head of the Bank of England, wrote last month, after the COVID crisis, it is reasonable to expect people demand improvements in the quality and coverage of social support and medical care, greater attention to be paid to managing tail risks, and more heed to be given to the advice of scientific experts. The great test of whether this new hierarchy of values will pervade, prevail is climate breakdown. After all, climate breakdown is an issue that first involves the entire world, from which no one will be able to self-isolate. Second, is predicated by science or predicted by science to be the central risk tomorrow. And third, we can only address if we act in advance and in solidarity. Many have compared the COVID crisis to armed conflict. After the First World War, the rallying cry was for a country fit for heroes to live in. Once the COVID-19 pandemic is over, our ambition should be bolder, nothing less than to make a planet fit for our grandchildren to live in. In the words, words of my Green colleagues in the European Parliament, our re-emergence from the COVID-19 crisis will be difficult. We will grieve. For some, the pain will be acute. Many will be under severe financial pressure. In many ways, the current crisis has left us feeling helpless with little control, but we do still have options. Instead of refurbishing a system which has shown its inherent weaknesses, we need to revitalise the economy through legally binding targets and targeted investments. We cannot keep supporting a system that abuses our planetary and environmental boundaries. We need a just transition and Green New Deal. As I have mentioned many times before in this chamber, a green recovery presents us with a short and long-term vision of sustainable jobs for life, with simultaneous improvements socially, environmentally and economically. It's not about getting back to business as usual, to a world where many struggle to get by, in a world endangered by escalating pollution and waste. It aims to reduce waste, cuts bills for participating households, sustains employment through recession, 
and modernise our housing stock. I will remind members I add again that the executive parties was committed to this and agreed in 2011. What is still missing from the executive is the very vision of what kind of world do we want to return to and how do we build back better. By focusing yet again on reactionary policies, we are avoiding implementing forward thinking, innovative and positive solutions to all the difficulties that are facing us. We have little, if any, information on depart the Department's expected savings or services that they will not be able to provide. The second budget bill, of course, is a practical solution to the short-term cash issues faced by some departments, but we still have no longer-term view of this year's budget. The Minister wrote today for the Irish News, and in conclusion, he mentioned that we face the existential threat of, the glo of global warming, which requires a transition to a zero-carbon economy, which I, of course, welcome. But I asked the Minister then, what is his and the Executive's vision? Will he commit to investing in a green recovery, a just transition, using a Green New Deal to reboot our economy, to create jo jobs, warm our homes, make our new homes sustainable, boost revenue, strengthen public service and increase prosperity and save our planet? Dealing with climate breakdown and our biodiversity crisis is not separate from our economic issues. They are all intrinsically linked. The executive must step up to the plate and show leadership when it comes to the climate emergency, and we need a clear long-term strategy. There is no time for further reactionary policies or sticking plasters to the serious issues ahead. Yes, Mr O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Just, and being that Mr. Carl is coming after me, just very briefly, I wonder if you could advise on the best way, in the absence of interventions being taken, for a member of this House to correct statements that have been made around a minister's portfolio, particularly in relation to Casement Park. I think some statements have been made which don't completely reflect the position, particularly when certain parties have had three years okay. to, the uh, to deal with these seat. issues, and they haven't. The member was a mistake. The member. Is a, is a relatively new member, but he's experienced about politics and was in Westminster for many years. He knows that's not a point of order. But he has observed, he's got his comments in the Hansard, even if he was chancing his arm to do it. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I spoke at length earlier uh, on, a, on obviously a very similar and connected issue, so I'll, not, I'll try not to repeat myself. Uh, but I have to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's become farcical in terms of the processes of scrutiny and accountability here. And I'm sure some of the comments raised by uh, Rachel Woods. In the space of a couple of hours, we've went from the first stage to the second stage of the budget bill, where we sit in the chamber uh, this afternoon. And it's only during this time, uh, while I'm seated here listening and taking part in debates, that I've been sent the most recent budget documents. And at a cursory glance, I emphasise that. Um, tell, it tells me that there is no, um, little or no serious detail about the breakdown of departmental spending. Uh, we then find out that opposition parties, only a handful of whom, or I'd say the, the five-part executive, must submit any amendments by tomorrow. I know the executive may not like scrutiny, Mr. Speaker, but this really takes a biscuit. Uh, suffice to say, I will be voting against this budget uh, for the same reasons I have already outlined earlier. Precisely when we need a break with the failed politics of, of the past, this budget, um, as I say, even at a glance, looks like a continuation of neoliberalism and, dare I say it, austerity politics. Um, major departments will be unable to meet costs, and Minister Murphy's attempts to present many figures as increases in spending are largely spin. Take the Health Department, already chronically underfunded, entering this crisis, as people have said. Um, any increase in spending runs far short of departmental requirements and simply reflect raising inflation and a population that is living longer. But much worse, if you actually read the finer detail of the projections, uh, health spending going forward is to be predicated on 50 million savings um, from health trusts, more austerity, uh, in other words. And shocking to think, like I said earlier, during a health pandemic, the executive is contemplating further austerity uh, across health trusts. Uh, and by the way, I think that's about five times I've raised this specific concern uh, in this chamber, and I've no direct response to it. Uh, the minister may accuse me of repetition. I stand guilty as charged, and I'll raise it again until I get an adequate response uh, to it from him or somebody else. That aside, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I wanted to at least partially respond to uh, the minister's uh, comments earlier uh, in relation to taxation, because frankly, I think the minister purposefully uh, caricatured the question um, in an effort at deflection. 
Let me repeat, like everyone, I am of course aware that taxation powers such as corporation tax are not currently under the control of the Executive. The point I made earlier today was that for a near 10-year period, both Sinn Féin and the DUP made lobbying for these powers in order to cut taxes for big businesses, their cornerstone economic policy. Indeed, uh, I'll give away in a second. <clears throat> Indeed, this policy, in a sense, defined the economic strategy of previous governments here for a decade. And I would suggest that it is hypocritical, to say the least, for a government par party to spend years talking about the need for tax cuts for big businesses and to then attack a sole MLA for raising uh, the issue uh, of the need to tax the rich during a crisis uh, like this. Uh, my suggestion is that during this coming decade, especially in the deep recession we now face into, we need an urgent reversal of this kind of politics, including raising taxes on the wealthy, raising corporation taxes, and in my opinion, an emergency wealth, wealth tax to ensure that those with the heavy shoulders carry the burden of the COVID-19 crisis. I want to ask the Finance Minister, would, would he at least principally support such a move? And if so, uh, has he ever raised it directly uh, with the, either his executive colleagues or indeed the British Treasury? Uh, during his, his few months uh, uh, in, uh, in office. Uh, Mr Buckley, uh, to respond to some of the uh, points raised already, Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr Bo Buckley referred to the take-take-take the take approach, I think advocated by myself, if I am referring to his comments correctly. Uh, and I think uh, in relation to corporation tax, I would suggest that he has not got the memo that corporation tax is no longer uh, in vogue. And indeed, uh, the trickle-down economics does not work and cannot uh, be implemented, especially uh, at, this, uh, at this period. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, ke ke briefly give away. Yeah. I thank the member for giving away. And I understand his principal position on corporation tax. It differs from my own. Uh, but would you not accept the point that you want to caricature corporation tax and tax cuts for big business? That's your line. That's your strap line. But would you not accept that the sole purpose is that to actually create employment and bring jobs to these shores for the very people that you talk about. Uh, I would uh, refer to the, the member that there is no actual evidence of that point that he just made. And actually, evidence on the research done about corporation tax being cut uh, is that it would give a gift to, to wealthy individuals and result in at least £200 million uh, being cut from the block grant, uh, at least, like I said. And the member's position seems to be uh, less trains and more tax cuts, which I think is something that should be opposed uh, by, by everybody. Um, Ms. Uh, Kiva Archibald, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, referred to uh, a windfall tax on corporations. That, that's something that I would absolutely support. And I, I would ask the Minister, does he? Uh, Karen Mullen uh, uh, emphasised the need uh, not to return uh, to austerity as the default position. I would agree with, with uh, Karen on that. I, uh, I would ask, does the Minister? Uh, and previously, in, in, in closing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, previously the Executive United. No, I'm not. I'm finishing my comments. Previously, the Executive United, uh, to get money to lay off thousands uh, of civil service workers, a regrettable and wrong move in my opinion. Um, will the Minister and the Executive now declare their support for an emergency tax on the wealthy and corporations, and if not, why not? Thank you. Thank you. Every member that indicated they wish to speak in the debate has, so I now call upon the Minister for Finance, Conor Murphy, to conclude and wind up the debate. Minister. Uh, I thanks to the members, to the chairs and the deputy chairs who have contributed to the debate uh, in the second stage of this budget number two bill. It has been useful to hear the views of the respective committee members and, and, and other members on important financial and economic issues that face us as the administration in these unprecedented, unprecedented times. I have noted down many of the issues. Some of them relate to people's own uh, particular committee responsibilities and departmental issues, and I, I don't purport to speak uh, in detail on behalf of, uh, of every single department here, but I will respond as best I can uh, to some of them. Uh, the chair of the Finance Committee uh, raised various issues. Uh, uh, one that has been raised by others, I think there were several references to the sole traders, uh, a number of speakers mentioned, and businesses that have fallen through the cracks, uh, and the, the intent behind the $40 million that we did set aside for business hardship was to try and capture as many. And it's, it's 
my experience of looking at the other business schemes is that there is such a variety and uniqueness about some businesses that it's almost impossible to capture their characteristic under any single scheme, but to try and capture as many as you can. I realise, and particularly in relation to sole traders, the criteria seem to change uh, after it was initially released, and that has caused uh, angst, uh, understandably, among them. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the, uh, it's, of course, a policy issue for the Department of the Economy. Uh, and I, I wish to see them try and, uh, and they understand that it's, it's, it's uh, an almost impossible task to capture every single business, but to capture as many as they can. And I have heard, as many others have repeated here today, the issue of sole traders being one of the key areas that seems to have, been, uh, have fallen through those cracks indeed. Uh, the, uh, the, the member also asked, sorry, in relation to the, the rates extension, the level of support and that, that detail, and, uh, and clearly we will get that detail in terms of what businesses are in and what businesses, because that has to come in the form of regulation and would obviously come through his own committee. I think Gordon Dunn also asked questions about that. That detail uh, will come, uh, and the, uh, we will provide that very shortly. Uh, also in relation to uh, the over commitment, uh, uh, in my view, there is an overcommitment in relation to what we have contributed. It's necessary because we have an emergency situation to try and get support to people, to the health system, to vulnerable people, to businesses. Uh, but the, uh, certainly, is, uh, in my view, some of the schemes that we have put out there and allocated money to would perhaps not spend out uh, according to what we had intended for them, and, and the, that will contribute significantly uh, to our ability to manage that overcommitment. And we also have commissioned a review, and, and several people asked this question in relation to uh, reprioritisation. We've commissioned a review across the executive to see that people spend out money they've been allocated, and if that's not going to be possible, then uh, how can we how can we use that in the time ahead? Uh, the deputy chair issued the, the, the issue in, in relation to scrutiny, and of course we've accepted. Uh, that, that scrutiny is the situation is not ideal. It's a fast-moving public expenditure situation, and any attempt by my department to produce a detailed document would have been thwarted by the need for the executive to react quickly uh, to emerging COVID-19 pressures. And, and people will understand that the vast majority of civil servants who are relied upon to put these documents together are working from home. Uh, that's not to say that they have been provided with the IT to do that, but that makes the putting together and the gathering up of figures across all the departments and collation of that into a single document very, very difficult to do. Uh, and of course, the role of the scrutiny committees in these restricted circumstances is all the more important uh, in doing that. And of course, I want to see them having uh, the information that they can, uh, they can, they need to have uh, in relation to that. Uh, I do intend to have a draft budget before the House in September. And the timing will depend on the, the spending review. People made references to the fact that they would like to see a longer-term budgetary process. Uh, of course, that's not dependent on, on necessarily on our actions, but actually dependent on the spending review that takes place in Westminster. Uh, that was due to take place over the summer, but it has been, it has been uh, postponed by the Treasury, and I hope that it takes place as soon as possible, because that will, in turn, uh, inform our ability to... Uh, to carry out a much longer term budgetary process and, and one which gives us uh, more planning ability in relation to budgets and allocation and uh, cohesion between programme for government objectives and, and budgets, budgetary spend and budgetary plans. Uh, the member also asked for a fuller explanation of the utility regulator. The vote on account only reflects the fund provided by the executive as the utility regulator receives most of its funding through receipts from industry is not directly from government. The vote on account figure for the utility regulator is relatively low. The total cash authorised utility regulator in 2019-20 in the spring supplementary estimates was significantly higher due to a one-off adjustment of £1 million, which is not required in 2021. So the 90 per cent figure is based on the 2019-20 cash requirement when the one-off adjustment is stripped out. Utility regulator is not featured in this budget because the 90 per cent vote and account was already given to it in the Budget Act 2020, and we have engaged with the Utility Regulator Office, office and they have confirmed they are content with the approach that we are taking in relation to that. Uh, some other uh, issues were, were raised. Uh, the uh, the uh, Matthew O'Toole raised the issue of that review of priorities uh, post-COVID. And uh, can I say that uh, that's, the, that's the trajectory that the, the executive was on. Uh, in the limited time that we had prior to the COVID uh, restrictions kicking in. The executive had met uh, on a number of occasions off campus, if you like, to discuss prioritisation, to discuss the general financial picture, to discuss what we wanted to achieve at the time ahead. 
uh, and had planned actually, when I go back to my diary and I look through, I see a number of dates struck out for executive away days, had planned a series of further engagements o over this period. So uh, I have no doubt that we we'll get back to that because that's the approach that this five party executive wanted to take. Uh, and, 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 uh, and allied to all of that is, of course, the issues around uh, fiscal commission and fiscal council. Uh, and the idea that we do want more taxation powers. And I'll come back to the, the point that uh, Mr. Carroll raised uh, at a later stage. Uh, the, uh, and he's right that the, the reduction in relation to non domestic rates, or the, the holiday we're given, is one of the probably only significant levers that we have. But bear in mind, in terms of business going forward beyond that, uh, and that, that's a very significant loss in terms of revenue income for the executive to give that holiday for the, the entirety of the year, four months for all businesses and a further eight months for those targeted interventions. Uh, but the, we also had included in terms of, of, of support to businesses uh, as part of the budget uh, be, between the uh, business rate reduction and the effective reval uh, uh, and an approximately 18% uh, reduction in relation to that. He also asked, as I think maybe Andrew Moore asked as well, in relation to borrowing powers, or perhaps it was in the earlier debate, this, this thing has gone on so long, I'm starting to merge some of the conversations from one debate to the next. But uh, they, to date, it took nearly two and a half million uh, or, sorry, 2,489 million has been borrowed, and the outstanding borrowing is 1,680 million. The interest charges are direct costs, the resource deal, and are 47.9 million uh, in this financial year. So the principal payments are a first call on the regional rates income. The executive has the ability to borrow up to 200 million each year, uh, and of course there were some suggestions in relation to other borrowing uh, that may become may be available, but. Uh, <coughs> Clearly, the priority at the moment has been to spend the COVID allocations we've got to look at reprioritisation of money that we won't spend uh, because of the restrictions on each department and to try and, and in the first instance, look to that uh, before we, we accrue any more uh, debt in, in relation to borrowing. Uh, there were, was also some discussion uh, on, uh, in terms of the economic recovery, the, the access to uh, financial transactions capital, and I think other people made that in, re in, in relation to housing and social housing build. Uh, and clearly, there, there, that has fallen traditionally over the last number of years uh, below the level that, that we would want to see. Part of that was the designation of the housing sector legislation was to have been brought through Westminster to, to effect change there, uh, and it didn't happen. And I know the communities minister has signalled that she wants to bring forward such legislation. So I would anticipate that the uh, uptake in financial transactions capital would increase uh, in the next budget, and we intend to commission further work to work with departments uh, in relation to, to that. Uh, another point that was made uh, by Andrew Moore was a couple of issues in terms of the economic recovery. Uh, social partnership, I agree with all of those approaches. Uh, is safe return to work. Uh, that will require investment, uh, and other people made this in terms of the uh, I think it was Rachel Woods who made this, and, and what are we doing to assist businesses in safe return to work? Well, part of the directed rates support was to recognise those businesses uh, who would have most difficulty returning to work, uh, and perhaps the economic impact would last the longest, particularly hospitality, tourism, leisure, uh, certain sections of retail, then that, that, that rates relief, if you like, was in effect money that they would not spend. Uh, and it's a substantial amount of money when you take it across all those range of businesses that that would permit some of them to invest in the limited return uh, to business that they would be able to experience over the coming months. Uh, so there was support for them in that regard. And of course, we're looking at procurement. Uh, we have sent a signal around departments uh, that they should be ready to assist in the return to work of the construction. Construction makes up about 25 per cent of our economy. A substantial portion of construction comes from public sector contracts. Uh, there's, I think, over a billion pounds worth of public centre contracts sitting in the system ready to go. We have asked departments to go look at that, to bring them forward to a point of readiness to, to award and allocate if we can get construction back up and working again so that, the, uh, so that the executive can play its role in relation to that, because we are the larger procurement of construction uh, uh, and it makes a very significant input to our economy. A number of people have mentioned the idea of, of, of future working and, and if, if anything, this is... Uh, Coronavirus experience has accelerated a number of things. One is the quickness with which the system can react. I know, I know other people refer to the red tape systems built on red tape. I think we have proved that if we need to react, we can uh, set aside the red tape. But also in terms of remote and agile working, uh, 
that, and the contribution that can make to uh, not only to having people having a better work-life balance and not having to travel in and out as I do and many others do to Belfast every day, but also that uh, you can reduce uh, carbon emissions in that way, you can contribute to a greener uh, economy, you can ensure that the congestion issues, particularly around the city of Belfast, are reduced. And so we have we had prior to the uh, outbreak of the virus, been looking at a series uh, from the Department of Finance, which is a responsibility for personnel. We've been doing some studies in relation to some of the significant business buildings on this estate and where people came from to work in those buildings. Uh, and then the idea of having, if you like, satellite locations right across uh, to allow those people to work at least two, three days closer to home, save those journeys, make an economic contribution into uh, towns and cities across the north uh, and reduce the carbon footprint and, and travel time lost and, and travel expense uh, in relation to that. So that idea of remote and agile working was already in the system, I think, the experience of this uh, and the, the, the upsurge in terms of IT uh, provision to civil servants then will, will accelerate that as it will in relation uh, to, to a number of matters. Uh, the, uh, John Buckley was asking about the, the cancer services in, in, in COVID times, and of course the discussion in the around the executive in recent times as, as the kind of the expected intervention in relation to COVID has, has begun to reduce in terms of the health service requirements. The, the discussion and the advice that we're being given by the health minister, who gives us a, a, a question and answer session, if you like, every executive meeting is in relation to how do we get back to the provision of the other services, very critical services. Uh, and so I know that the minds of the health department are looking uh, in relation to all of that. Uh, and he does mention, and I, I, again, it's, it's from a different angle, the, the point of corporation tax. And I think in the time ahead, we're going to have to look at setting aside the corporation tax issue, which was never the cornerstone of any economic policy that I uh, was involved in. But setting aside that as an issue in terms of FDI, we're going to have to recognise in the, in the short to medium term that FDI is probably not going to be something which is possible. And we're going to have to look at that role of Invest NI, and, and I'm sure the Economy Minister will address this in the paper uh, that she has provided to the Executive. We're going to have to look at the role of Invest NI and actually support local Indigenous businesses to try and ensure, and it goes back to another point I think that perhaps Sinead Ennis made in terms of security of supply. Uh, these things becoming more critical than cheaper price, which was the rush uh, in terms of procurement, and not in terms of foreign investment, in terms of procurement to get cheaper goods at the other side of the world. But similarly, we're coming into a different economic reality on the other side of this, and some of that will not be about chasing the FDI, because it won't be available to us in the short to medium time ahead, and we need to concentrate on local businesses. I'll give away. For giving way and his willingness to look at creative ways in which we can attract, whether it's FDI or etc., because he, he will bear notice to the fact that cutting taxation albeit might be popular for some to shout about, but the fact being the cutting and the, of, the rate, of the rates bill for those businesses at, during COVID-19 is crucial to their uh, survival post-COVID. So, so that's a perfect example of how creative thinking in relation to taxation can help businesses now and in the future. Yes, I absolutely agree. I, I'm just making the point in relation to the emphasis on FDI and the, the, the need for us all to rethink what the priorities had been prior to March and where we are in the world and how the, the global economy has changed uh, and how our position in that has changed and the need to ensure that we support local economic recovery as best we can. Uh, Keith Archibald made a, a, a number of points which I agree with in terms of principles of recovery and, and, and workers' rights and remote and agile working and green climate recovery. And, uh, looking at the issue of tax loopholes, which I'm happy to press with Treasury, uh, and supply chain sec security, and that, that feeds into the last point uh, in which uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I was remarking. And, uh, Gordon Dunn uh, uh, raised the ongoing support for manufacturing, and of course manufacturing still continues to benefit from that uh, uh, manufacturing relief, which was worth about 70 per cent, so it had the entirety, which didn't apply in Britain, uh, because manufacturing, commercial, service industries didn't get uh, rates reduction or rates holiday in Britain. Uh, we have all sectors of business for four months, and then manufacturing continues to benefit from that rates reduction it enjoys, which again is unique to here, doesn't experience uh, anywhere else. Uh, and uh, Janet McLaughlin is away, but one of the points she did raise, which, which kind of uh, uh, has me wondering uh, in relation to, she, she asserts that McGee and the University of Ulster are, are deeply uncertain, as she is in relation to the next steps. And I know it was very extensive 
consultation and dialogue with McGee over the last number of weeks in which I was advised that they were very certain and supportive of the steps that were taken and uh, I'm pleased that that, that gave them a, a sense of security. So I, I'll have to go back and check with those who were speaking to them from a very senior level in the executive if that's now not the case uh, uh, in relation to that. Can I say Karen Mullins' point in relation to childcare is well made and that's why the executive decided to include the childcare sector in that sector which would experience rates holiday right to the end of the financial year because we recognised very much uh, that it was another sector uh, that, that was going to struggle in terms of the uh, distancing, social distancing measures that were required that had effectively collapsed over the period of this lockdown and was going to struggle in the time ahead uh, to, get, to get up and going. Uh, John Blair had asked about the, uh, the cost arrangements for the protocols for the Brexit. Uh, and of course, we did get some Brexit no, uh, no deal money last year ahead of the executive coming back, some of which was been able to be used, it was retained, and uh, obviously no deal then didn't happen, although a version of no deal could likely happen, or could well happen in the time ahead. Uh, and clearly with the Treasury have committed to any spend that is required to give effect to Brexit that they will provide, so we will hold them to that in the time ahead. Uh, Declan McAleer, on behalf of the uh, Agriculture Committee, uh, raised the issue of the COVID support and obviously we have provided £25 million and the Agriculture Minister did update us on a regular basis about the pressures across all the sectors in agriculture so I will assume that he wants to ensure that there is a fair distribution of that level of support across all sectors uh, because clearly there is a recognition uh, that all of the sectors in agriculture were, support, uh, were suffering as a consequence uh, in relation to this. Colin McGrath raised the issue of victims' pensions and he had me confused at one stage where I agree with him entirely that the, uh, the victims' pension issue was a British Government policy. It was legislated for by them. Uh, many of the victims they are addressing uh, and the suffering that they address happened under the Watch of Direct Rule. Uh, and of course, I am very firmly of the view that the costs of that uh, should be met by the British Government. Uh, he said in his remarks that the Executive should not have to pay this on its own. So I am not sure whether he means we should prepare a proportion of that, and if we should, what proportion is he suggesting? Uh, but uh, certainly, it is my view that the responsibility, that, even under the policy rules that the British Government operate by, the, the, it's their policy, they devised it, they legislated for it, they're responsible for any payment which, which comes out of that. And that's the, that's the argument we made very clearly to them. And it is unfortunate that the people who have suffered the most are caught in the middle of this argument, but it wouldn't be if the British government adhered to their own rules uh, that they operate on. I have to say that, you know, the, the idea that it, it kind of becomes a, a, a bit of a myth that if it's repeated often enough becomes a fact in, in relation to some of the SDLP spokespersons that we're three years without assembly uh, and that the budget allocations to larger parties were made and that they're going to continue, you're going to scrutinise and make sure this doesn't happen again. I mean, I, I'm not aware that, that the budgets were allocated on the basis of that in previous executives. And I, I've spoken to your leadership right across the three years that we were with our assembly, and there were times, I know they changed their view at times, but there were many times they were fully supportive of no return to this assembly on the conditions that applied at that time. So the idea that you're absolved of any responsibility for any of that, uh, and that this notion that the, uh, there was a budget carve up uh, in relation to large parties, and it, it wouldn't have been acceptable, and I'm sure the assembly wouldn't have accepted uh, a, a vote in that regard in, in relation to that. Uh, I, I agree with him in relation to Brexit extension. Uh, he'll know, I don't have to tell him this, he's chair of the TEO, that that's not an executive position because there is differing views within the executive, but I, he knows that the parties who favoured Remain uh, agree on that position, that there should be an extension to the Brexit discussions, even though we don't agree with the outcome of that, but nonetheless to try and conclude those in a, uh, in a sort of a fashion which is, 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 has, doesn't take any account of the loss of momentum that there has been over, over this last period will actually lead us to, I think, a more damaging outcome than would otherwise have been the case, and that we will ship some damage as a consequence uh, of Brexit. Uh, the, uh, I think it was uh, Kelly Armstrong asked me about uh, what happens post-October. Uh, in relation to the, the finances, we, 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 when we reach October, we accessed up to 80% of our vote on account, and we're obviously working to bring a main estimate and associated budget bill to the Assembly in the, in the autumn, in the early autumn, and that allows us to access all available cash, but also access available cash and access to receipts and accruing resources that are not available at the present time. So it's not just the remaining 
20 percent it's it's what money the executive would accrue uh, over the course of that so we also have further spring supplementary estimate before the end of the final year to allow for further monitoring rounds that will take place throughout the course of the year so th there is a uh, 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 a plan in place to manage all of this. No doubt it's going to be uh, challenging, but there is a plan in place to do all of this. Uh, she mentioned a, a range uh, of issues that we needed to spend on, and uh, uh, in terms of reprioritisation, uh, I, I think she maybe echoed the Justice Committee Chair in one of the previous debates, where he said the committees did have an important role to make sure departments weren't sitting on money just in the off chance that they might spend it, but that they actually had a, a long, hard look. That's what we've been asking them to do. I have to say the response has been patchy, uh, and uh, we, need, we need committees to perform a function in that if we want to ensure that we have sufficient funds at the end of this financial year to deal with all of the things uh, and the ongoing effect of the downturn uh, in relation to uh, the outcome of COVID uh, will undoubtedly have. Uh, and as I say, I've addressed some of the issues she mentioned in terms of financial transaction capital. Uh, the, the, the issue of spending in uh, Northern Ireland Water and TransLink, uh, as we said, we, we have given the largest allocation in that department's history to the Department of Infrastructure. And clearly, they have to set their priorities within that capital allocation. Uh, and so, uh, undoubtedly, I, I know that the, uh, the infrastructure minister is aware of the need for investment uh, in Northern Ireland water and the, uh, the issue of uh, the need for investment in transit. Can I say, in relation to the status of Northern Ireland water, to change it? In a previous life, when I was minister for regional development, I brought a proposition to the executive to change the status of NIW to achieve the outcome that she argued. And I never got the backing from one single other party. Uh, to change the status of NIW, and the issue went back onto the shelf. So I, I wish luck to the Minister for Infrastructure this time around if she can do something in relation to that. Uh, in relation to some of the points that uh, Rachel Woods made, in terms of accelerated passiveness, we just had the debate. The, we, I can't ram stand through accelerated passes. The, not only does the committee have to agree, having had some discussion with officials and some sight of what we're trying to do, but the assembly has to actually vote to set aside the stand in order to allow accelerated passage. So I, I agree with her. It's not ideal. It's not the way we want to do business, but it's not undemocratic because I can't do it unless the assembly vote by cross-community support uh, to, to, uh, to agree that we can run this, th this uh, budget process in, in a way which hasn't been done before and which isn't a way I would want to revisit again uh, because I want to ensure that it's done in the correct way uh, and we're not faced with circumstances such as we are. The PPE requirements she asked about in and, and terms of the second wave, uh, and that's we continue to uh, actively pursue significant and sufficient PPE to meet our demands in the time ahead. Uh, and I'm doing that alongside the Health Minister, uh, and we hope to be able to uh, see that uh, through in the not too distant future. Uh, and in terms of the local council COVID allocation, we got £50 million in a Barnet consequences. So that's a measure of what was given to local councils in Britain. Uh, now, local councils in Britain, as you'll understand, deliver uh, education services, deliver uh, social services as well, which aren't delivered by our local councils here. So when those were stripped out, we had a Barnet allocation of 20 million, which was given to local government. Uh, now, the Department for Communities will work out the formula uh, by which that is uh, distributed, and, and obviously the local government will be involved in discussing that and the, the priorities to which they will put that. But uh, we certainly understand the challenges faced by local government, and we want to support them in relation to all of that. She mentioned a whole range of other issues. Uh, and every one of them, the answer to them was more resource. So if I was answering them collectively, the very short answer is no. We do not have enough resource to cover all of the issues that you've mentioned. We have a limited resource, uh, and we have given away, as a consequence of support and business, a significant access to revenue that's available to the executive over the course of a year. So we will not have enough resource to do all of the things that you have asked us to do. And that means that we have to prioritise, and that's what these debates are for. That's what the discussion with the committees are for, is to recognise we have a very limited uh, financial allocation. We need to prioritise it. We need to agree those priorities. Where they're wrong, we should be criticised, and we're open to criticism. But we can't make the pot any bigger. As a matter of fact, in terms of the financial supports we've put out there, we've actually shrunk the pot uh, over the last number of weeks. Uh, but everybody told us it was the right thing to do in terms of ensuring businesses didn't go out of business, and, and I'm sure she doesn't disagree with that. And I fully agree with her in terms of the, uh, what she talks about, a sustainable, fair and just recovery. That's exactly what I'd like to see. 
I recognise that I'm part of a five-party executive, uh, and those agreements have to be won around the executive table, but I can assure her that that will be my endeavour uh, over the time ahead. The NDA commitments she, she made uh, reference to, uh, of course, and, and I think I remarked on this in the previous debate, uh, no sooner had we agreed, and we all agreed our political agreements as part of NDNA, and we hold to them as part of NDNA, the financial commitments were reneged on immediately. They weren't a wish list. They weren't a pie in the sky. They were worked through. I sat in on the meetings. They were worked through with senior officials uh, in the Department of Finance, the head of civil service, senior officials in the NIO, and we were told at every stage of it that these commitments would be met by the British government as part of any agreement reached, uh, and they were very quickly disowned on the other side. We haven't given up in relation to that. I intend to still take that issue up with Treasury. You may have noticed it kind of went by on notice that we managed to secure the confidence supply money that was agreed by the DUP and the Conservative Party recently, and so that was a welcome uh, contribution to our budget. So I don't intend to give up in relation to these things. Uh, and uh, Jerry Carroll was the last speaker, and I absolutely agree with the. He, he quoted some of the other speakers. Of course, I agree with him. That's uh, it's, it's our party policy. One of the differences is that when we make arguments in relation to that, particularly in the South, we have to go and we have to go and cost all of those issues. So if we're going to make a contribution to a budget debate in the South. We have to go, and all the propositions that we criticise the government and their approach were down there, we go and cost those with the Department of Finance and we put up an alternative budget. So I would recommend it to him at some stage uh, to go and try and do that because he can tell us, and he's entitled to criticise, and that's what he's here for, to represent people who voted for him. Uh, but also, it's, it, you know, at some stage you have to, uh, you have to say, he, here's my priorities, here's what they'll cost, here's where you're spending. Uh, and that's what I disagree with, and that money could go there and have a better outcome. And I'd look forward to hearing that from at some stage. Uh, can I say, in relation to corporation tax, it was not the cornerstone of any policy. It was an agreement, and if he reads the Stormont House Agreement, which it was mentioned, it was very clear that it was in the context of it being affordable, that if the executive considered it to be affordable. Uh, and clearly, since that, uh, since that uh, I'll just finish this point and I'll take him in, if everybody's happy to stay here all evening. But, uh, since that point, clearly the executive has considered it not to be affordable. And I said very early, early on in my position as finance minister that it was not something I was pursuing. And I think the, actually the economy minister said herself she agreed with that position. £417,000 in preparing for a tax reduction. I think this was revealed by Mr Reagan um, in a question some years ago, including developing new IT systems. I welcome if he's changed his position, but surely that was a, a cornerstone policy of the executive for many years. Well, as I said, in relation to uh, corporation tax, it was no cornerstone policy. Uh, it was something that the executive would consider in terms of its affordability, and it clearly was never considered to be affordable, and, and is not pursued and is not being pursued. Uh, so, as I say, we have a responsibility where we do make these arguments from an oppositional point of view to actually cost them and go and present them so that they can be scrutinised. Uh, and I would, I would invite him to do something similar. I realise he may not have the same resources available to them, but some attempt at doing that would be would be would be welcome. Uh, pre blaskan Corda, I'm sure you'd be delighted to know I'm going to draw my remarks to conclusion. Uh, I have tried to respond to as many of the relevant issues raised as possible. As always, the debate has been very useful, with many significant points raised, and I'm thankful to the members for that. It's imperative that the legislation debate today continues its passage through this Assembly so that public services here can be delivered without delay or interruption. So, in conclusion, pre vlaskan I ask members to support the bill, thereby authorising spending on public services by departments in the 2020-21 for the vote on account. Thank you, Minister. Before we proceed to the question, I would advise members that as this is a budget bill, this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the second stage of the budget number two bill be agreed. All those who are in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any? If Mr Carroll and Ms Woods, were you the other? No? No, you weren't. If Mr Carroll, you would like me to record that you have voted no, that's now in Hansard and we can avoid a division of the House. So that's now in the record that you were against. So I'll ask the question again. The question is, the question is that the second stage of the budget number two bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.
That concludes the second stage of the Budget Bill. Amendments to the Bill may be submitted to the Bill Office up to 12 noon, Wednesday the 27th of May. Item number four on the order paper is the adjournment. Before I put the question, I remind members of the next plenary session of this.